I open the joint meeting and call the parish council meeting to order. Open the city council meeting and open it for order. Okay. We welcome you to the special joint meeting of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council. As presiding officer and chair, I'd like to announce the following. This is a public hearing. To address the council on any item on this agenda, please fill out the speaker form and submit it to the clerk prior to the call of the agenda item or you will not be given an opportunity to speak. Staff assistance is available if needed. Items for submission to the council should be handled and handed to council clerk, Ms. Veronica Williams, who's seated all the way to my left. You're right. When addressing the council, state your name and title for the official record. There's a five minute rule that is in effect. There will be no debating or confrontational statements that will be allowed. The front row to my left is for media only. Please silence all cell phones and electronic devices. Meeting procedures are by resolution and not by Robert's rules of order. All documents with reference to meetings can be found on the LCG website. And finally, the council encourages your involvement in boards or commissions. If you're interested, please call 337-291-8800. Chair announcements. For those tuning in from home or other locations, you can call 291 8428 if you wish to speak please keep in mind that there is a delay when viewing on tv and via the internet i don't have any chair announcements of my own at this time i will move to council announcements and i'll give the floor to councilman andy nakan good evening um i just want to make sure that businesses were aware of this the louisiana main street recovery program it's 275 million dollars being brought in through the COVID-19 recovery program for the business in the state. And each business can apply for $15,000 in grants. And you'd be surprised what you can receive and recover money for what expenses you've incurred because of this pandemic. Um, I think it's very important that businesses realize this and apply for the grant. Um, it's the money's there. Go and get it. If, you, if your business qualifies and it sounds like it's easy to qualify, go get the money. It's important that y'all do that for your sake. Um, the website is LouisianaMainStreet.com. And uh, I encourage everybody who has a small business or any kind of business just to go try. You know, I mean, up to $15,000, you would pl plug a lot of holes for a lot of people. But I just want to make sure people are aware of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Andy Nakia. Any other council announcements? Seeing none, we'll move to the Executive Mayor President's report at this time. Mayor Guillory, you have the floor, sir. All right. Hey, man. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. And I apologize for my delay. Which item we on? Oh, <laughs> now I was told it was a murder. Get down here. I have nothing to report at this time other than uh, just an announcement just to everyone that we are celebrating today. 100 year anniversary for women's right to vote. I think that's something we can all wrap our arms around and be proud of. So 100 years, thank you. So, and that is all I have on the executive report. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, appreciate it. Public hearing, proposed physical year 2020-21 budget. Open public hearing for citizen input on matters on the proposed budget. I will announce that this is the time to speak about topics relative to the physical year 2021 proposed budget. No debating, please, confrontational statements or anything disrespectful. For efficiency and to allow everyone the opportunity to speak, questions should be submitted in writing to the clerk of the council and we will get those answers to you. Because of the number of speakers, I ask that the speakers be allowed to complete their comments without interruption. Everyone is here waiting to speak, so let's allow them to do so, so the next speaker may uh, provide their own comments. There is a five minute rule that will be in effect. And uh, at this time, Ms. Williams, call for the first speaker. First speaker, and I'm not sure if he wants to speak. Um, it, Dan Araby, does he wants to speak? Thank you. Jarrett Eubanks. And again, this is matters related to the budget. 
Jared Eubanks will be followed by Tad Reshort. And if you could, um, if your name is called up next, could you come to the center aisle and wait until um, they, they've completed their comments and then you can start speaking. Good evening. My name is Jared Eubanks. I'm a resident of City District 2 and Parish District 5. So I want to thank my representatives, Mr. Rubin and Mr. Andy Notcam. And thank you to the council and everyone in attendance tonight. There's quite a bit to unpack with this budget. Uh, we have many people here tonight that I'm sure are going to speak ardently about the needs and priorities of this community. I stand in solidarity with so many of them. The layoffs in our park and rest staff and underfunding the department threaten to destroy an asset that Lafayette has built over the last 50 years. This is short-sighted and frankly the way these cuts were implemented seems capricious. There are over three dozen people already laid off based on this proposed budget, despite the fact that the fiscal year is still ongoing, despite the fact that the city is proposing an amendment to use city funds to maintain the parks and red budget that these people are paid from, despite the fact that the final budget is the council's final say, not the administration. So I'm asking the council to not condone these cuts nor these layoffs. The sudden critical cuts to our science museum and other arts and culture program in general seem equally destructive without good sense. Perhaps there's a route for more self-sustaining versions of some of these programs, and maybe there are viable partnerships out there. That doesn't explain why we're putting the cart before the horse on this. We're going to maim these programs with these budget cuts, and once they're hobbled, then we're gonna suggest they go find creative solutions. Let's do the work first. None of you have impending elections in the next couple of years. We have time to work into these changes. There are a lot more arguments to be said about the values and priorities of the constituents that are playing in this budget process, but I'm concerned we're not really even tackling them earnestly. This is the first time in over two decades that we see two independent councils working together to form a budget. This is the primary reason we had the fix the charter vote that passed. We have a city council now because there was a vote for city level control of our city tax dollars. That is not what has been happening so far in this budget process. The city council is facing objection by the parish council on allocating city funds to programs that are 100% funded by the city. A great example of this is the Hyman Center, a measly $100,000 amendment to keep the Hyman Center operational next year, and Mr. Carlson objects to it. This is being pushed and backed up by an administration who seems to only be seeking legal counsel that condones the action of the parish council from an attorney that is unfairly tasked with representing both parties in a negotiation. Currently, even if the parish does not block these amendments where the city proposes using city funds, these items could be line item vetoed, and then they would turn, be turned back over to a joint council where it would just take two members of the parish council to block any attempts of overturning a veto and delegating how city funds are used. I, for one, am not comfortable with taking someone's word that will not happen, especially in the light of objections and breaches of trust that have already occurred. I'm not a lawyer or legal scholar, but we have had re heard references to the Charter Section 211E, which explains the general nature of our joint services. We have not, however, heard anyone re referencing 504A, which reads, except an amendment to the operating budget for a line item of the operating budget or a component unit of the city parish government that is funded solely by the city of Lafayette shall be submitted to the city council for adoption. It also says the same for anything funded solely by the parish. This seems to carve out a specific exemption from the more general structured language of uh, 211E. This is why I think the first step for the city council in making sure this budget sets precedent of fair government where taxes are controlled by the taxpayers elected representatives is obtaining independent legal counsel for the matters in the budget. This is provided for in the charter as well. It not only protects the city council and the city taxpayers, but our city parish attorney who I think are being put in a position that is ethically murky regardless of their best intentions. I'm encouraging the city council until they are confident they have control over city funds that they were elected to exert. They should not approve any part of this budget. We have a budget that can continue in effect for an ex extended six months if we do not uh, approve one in time. And approving this while we are not controlling city tax dollars, that is tantamount to taxation without representation. Thank you guys and have a good evening. Thank you. Ted Reshort followed by Sarah Brown. <laughs> And please alternate podiums. All right, y'all, let's pull the scab off of this one. Lafayette Parish is racist. 
And all of the people that live here in Lafayette Parish are victims of systemized racism. My name is Ted Richard, and I graduated from Karen Crow High School in 1980. I knew what racism was when I was in elementary school. I was one of the first classes that actually was integrated in 1970. Even though integration passed in 1965, Lafayette Parish has never been the first to the trough. It's always been one of the last. Let's just be honest about that. So we know that Lafayette Parish is racist, and the reason I call it systemic racism is because when I leave Lafayette Parish because I don't like the racism and I don't like the homophobia, and I come back 40 years later and nothing has changed, that is the definition of systemic racism. Okay? So let's talk about how we get rid of systemic racism. First of all, you build a statue to do one of two things. Celebrate something or memorialize something. We're talking about the Alfred, uh, the Mouton statue, about wanting to get it removed. That's perfect. Ted, but I hate to cut you off. You're on a roll. You sound good. It's got to be about the budget. It is about the budget. I'm getting there. Okay. Okay. Oh, it is about the budget. Okay. Okay. So, so anyway, so we're talking about the Mouton statue, and and you could put my five seconds back on the clock, but that's all right. You got it. <laughs> but, you got. It. I didn't know you were going about the budget because you were going like. All around. You, you hit the new loop that we should build around Lafayette. Yeah. You were going all no, around. No, no. Go right, ahead. Right. You're good. No, no, no. No, but, but what, I, what I'm saying is that, so, so, so I was going to talk about the statue, but what we did with the statue is we made that a big, big, big focus. And in the meantime, while we're saying we're going to move the statue, we closed four, four uh, recreation centers on the north side. In the meantime, we found in the new budget a way to add $1.25 million to the Sheriff's Department's budget. So I guess that means that all of these kids that can no longer go to these uh, recreational centers, we cannot put them in jail. Because that's kind of how the system works, right? I think that's kind of how we do it. This administration has eliminated more black um, excuse me, more black positions within this administration than the prior three administrations combined. Okay. So, um, while I'm on the subject of the jails, why are we adding $1.25 million to the jails budget? I don't understand that. The city of Lafayette pays a million dollars a year to keep people in jail. If it costs only $25 to keep a person in jail, that means that that $1 million can only house 109 people for the whole year. That's what a million dollar covers. 1 million, 109 times 25 times 365 is right at about a million dollars. So who's paying for all of the rest of the 900 prisoners that are in jail? The city's not paying for it. Scott's not paying for it. Karen Crow's not paying for it. Um, Youngsville isn't. Broussard isn't. Tucson isn't. Why aren't all these other cities putting into that budget? That needs to be something that's discussed. You know? And while we're at it, why do we need jails to hold up to 1,000 people? We don't need to incarcerate that many people. We need to be smart about the people that we incarcerate. You know, I mean, right now in the, middle of the, in the middle of the pandemic, I know that, you know, they're putting, you know, restrictions on who gets arrested and who's not. But, I mean, recently there was a transgender person that was murdered, and that person was not put in jail. So I guess murder matters unless you murder a transgender person. That's just what I got out of it. You know, and I mean, I wish the sheriff was here because Sheriff Garber and I had this conversation when I was running for office, and my recommendation to him was to close the downtown jail, sell the downtown jail, do something constructive with it. If you sell the downtown jail, you don't have to spend $3.5 million on the Buchanan garage. You can build a brand new one and do something else with the old Buchanan. So that's kind of where I wanted to go with this and talk about how systematic racism and the way it's worked in Lafayette Parish since the day I was born has not changed because everything about this budget goes back to systemic racism. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Sarah Brown followed by Devon Norman.
Hello. Mayor, President, and Council Persons, my name is Sarah Brown, and I'm a citizen, homeowner, and business owner in Lafayette. For the last two months, I've been drawn into the civic conversation like never before, and I'm honored to be a small part of this historic moment. I want to begin by acknowledging some great ideas that I've heard from coming to these meetings over the last several weeks. Uh, the idea of the Bayou Vermilion District and the Nature Station working together is an innovative solution and sounds like it will benefit both parties. I likewise commend the Parish Council for their ongoing efforts to have municipalities take over responsibility for the parish parks. That is an area where we all seem to be in agreement. And these ideas are marked by deliberation, innovation, and collaboration. Why not take the spirit of these aforementioned efforts into the conversation about the Science Museum, the Hyman Performing Arts Center, the Acadiana Center for the Arts, the LCG Arts and Culture Grants, the 37 employees laid off from parks and recreation. At present, we have drastic cuts that have not been well thought out or discussed at length with the interested parties. I can agree that complex conversations need to be had regarding our cultural assets. However, I do not agree that they should be defunded in this rash manner, especially when we have $890,000 expressly set aside for recreation and culture. As other speakers are sure to point out, the budget projections need to be adjusted closer to reality. We do have the funds available to restore these assets while we, as a community, work together to achieve greater fiscal responsibility as is your stated goal, Mr. Mayor President. I would like to take a moment to address some special concerns. I'm in full support of the reinstatement of the 37 laid off parks and recreation employees. The laid off employees include the parks police, so I was here last week when the interim chief of police said that indeed knowledge would be lost with these people being let go. And I'm in full support of Councilman Lazard's motion to restore the parks and recreation funding out of the general fund. Mr. Mayor President, you spoke of finding innovative solutions to the parks and recreation issue and asked for the community's support. I will help find the solutions, but I believe that we need our 37 experienced employees to maintain our parks while we figure it out. Another concern close to me is the LCG Arts and Culture Grants. This item is on page 210 of the budget, uh, line item 76025-0. This fund of 111,000 is being proposed to be cut in half to 55,000. As far as I'm aware, there have been no amendments proposed to address this cut. This $111,000 does a great deal of good supporting some of our most impactful cultural assets such as Festival International, while also supporting grants to our small but mighty cultural organizations, many of which will be speaking to you today. This investment of $111,000 is honestly shamefully small when you consider the direct economic impact of our festivals and cultural institutions. To think of cutting in half this small of a fund is absurd and makes me question if these cuts were ever about fiscal responsibility in the first place. Mayor President and council persons, the community has spoken. Arts, culture, parks and recreation are a priority. These are the very things that make Lafayette world famous. These are the things that influence whether young professionals will make Lafayette their home. We cannot afford to let them falter. You will be in your elected positions for more years to come. The fact is, you have time. If we want to foster more innovation in our creative sector and more financial stability, let's do that. Let's work together over the next few years to do that work with the deliberation and care that it deserves. Let's not pit our creative entities against each other, scrambling for dwindling resources. Let us not, as a community, fail, fall into the clutches of partisan politics, but rather work together to do what is right. Let's take our time and make the effort necessary to restore the trust that has been lost in this process. To that end, I support and uh, the creation of a cultural commission, which is something that we don't currently have, to help with this and the issues that will lie ahead of us. Culture is a need, not a want. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Devon Norman, followed by Marja Brusor. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Devon Norman. I am the Young Adult Committee Chairperson of the NAACP here in the city of Lafayette. I am also the Community Liaison of Gethsemane Church of God in Christ here in the city of Lafayette as well. I rise today um, the, hoping and prayerful that the council would sit, both councils would seriously consider um, reinstating the 37 employees that lost their jobs on Friday. My heart has been grieved ever since that day. I've not been able to sleep because I understand all too well that this all could have been done a different way. Unfortunately, we can't go back to the past and change things. But what I'm hopeful is that today we can send a signal to our city and to our community that change is on the horizon. And that no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, that we can come together, community, community leaders, elected officials, and all that are concerned to make sure that we don't have this situation again, even in the middle of a pandemic. What this tells us is that there are some, some things that have long, long before Mayor President was in office or any of you were ever in office, that there are some systemic problems that we have to address. And what we can't do is to continue to allow those, those problems to perpetuate our systems. And so what's happening now is that there's an uprising of the people in the streets, at their homes, and everywhere else because they're sick and tired of taxation without representation. Many of us hear that term and we don't really understand what it means. And simply, all we're saying is that we are tired of having to pay somewhere to live, that we are not, that the, the fairness, we are not fairly represented with our dollars. And so all we're saying today is that the 37 employees that unnecessarily lost their jobs and their benefits, and many of those people have pre-existing conditions. Many of those people's family members depend on their jobs and on their livelihoods. And I don't know if you're, if you had a chance to meet any of those people, but so many of them take pride in working for the city of Lafayette. So many of them take pride in having, in having a, a good job, and some of them come from, have backgrounds that may not be so great, but they are grateful to have an opportunity to represent this city. And so all we're simply saying today is that the city and the parish would restore, that, would bring back that same courtesy to those people, that on today, we can fight for those people, especially when the physical year isn't even over. We can do something about this, and I would hope that the parish and the city would do what's right. I would hope that we can, that we can come together on this, and moving forward, then I, will be, I would have trust. And I know that many in the community would have trust in our government to see that even when we make mistakes, we can own up to those mistakes, we can fight for what's right, and we can fight through it together. We may not agree on everything, but leadership is needed right now more than anything. Leadership that we can trust, leadership that we can depend, that no matter what your political affiliation is, no matter what your, what your religious background is, that at the end of the day, the one thing that we can come together on is how we take care of our children, how we take care of our elderly, and how we take care of each other. It's no way in the world that we can continue to allow the most vulnerable in our communities. And I'm not just talking about black and brown people. I'm talking about children. I'm talking about our elderly. I'm talking about our mothers and grandmothers. I'm talking about the safety and well-being of our people, all of the citizens of Lafayette and the parish. See, what I'm saying is that these recreation centers being staffed, it's not only about those individual employees, but it's about the people that go to those centers, that depend on those, on those workers, that depend on them to be there when they may not be able to tell their mother or their grandmother what's going on in their life, but they can trust the worker. And we believe that in the middle of a global pandemic, when we do understand that most of these people are African American that are working for these facilities, when 70% of the people that are dying from this virus and in the middle of civil unrest all across the country where racial tensions have found its ugly head up unrooted, that it is unethical and immoral to let these people go now when we don't have to. So as I always echo, I would hope and pray that the council and the mayor president and all of our leaders would be arrested by God and that his spirit would continue to speak to you on this matter and on all of the matters concerning our people. May God continue to bless and keep you. And remember, this is not a moment 
but it is a movement. Thank you, sir. Next, Next speaker. speaker is Marja Broussard, followed by Daniel Latmoral. Sir, you missed a Daniel? No, I'm not. What? Did y'all figure it out? Okay. Uh, good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, I'm Marjorie Broussard. I just handed to Ms. Veronica, uh, the clerk, my comments. Uh, the NAACP call to action containing a list of over 50 community businesses and organizations who supports our efforts and documents showing attesting to our attaining over 5,600 electronic signatures in support of our efforts. I'm Marja Broussard, I'm the president of the NAACP, state vice president of the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the world celebrating 111 years this year. The Lafayette NAACP <clears throat> not only supports park, not only supports park police, not only support the 37 employees, but we support community development, senior centers, uh, opening the arts, the campgrounds, and we are all on one accord on this. It's really a sad day in Lafayette when we have a mayor president, Guillory, who ignores the cries of the community he serves. Many believed that because the recreation centers are remaining open, the 37 jobs, <coughs> excuse me, would not be in jeopardy, but we know that on August the 14th, those 37 people did indeed lose their jobs and lost their health care in the middle of a pandemic. We also know that 26 of the 37 were, who were laid off are African Americans. We know now that the recreation centers will remain open and we're thankful for that. However, the 37 employees still uh, still have indeed lost their jobs, not to mention the 101 employees who lost their jobs since Mayor President Guillory took office. While laying off people, Mayor President Josh Guillory has not only curated a six-figure income administrative positions, but he's given raise to selected employees. This budget is in place until October 31st. Mayor Josh Guillory has yet to satisfactorily explain to the community he serves why <clears throat> He is in such a rush to lay off these employees in the middle of a pandemic. We know the money is available. We know that we have the money. We strongly believe the actions of Mayor Josh Guillory is racially motivated. We condemn and denounce his reckless leadership, uh, the reckless leadership of Mayor President Josh Guillory. Again, we stand with the arts, the museum, the nation stations, uh, Hyman Performance Arts Centers, uh, senior centers, campgrounds, nature trail, park, and recreation. We ask the council to please use all of your powers as, legis as the legislative branch to restore these unnecessary cuts. In closing, which is not part of my notes that I handed to her, but uh, it, it appears as if we're picking on certain uh, budget pieces of the budget, but I don't hear any discussion about uh, the sheriff receiving $2 million and what that $2 million is for. Thank you, and those are my comments. Good evening. Thank you. Next Daniel Admiral and then Tara Laxey. Thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Daniel Ladmoreau. I am the program director at Cité des Arts in downtown Lafayette. Cité des Arts has been around for 18 years in our same location at 109 Vine Street. We attract audiences from all the parishes in Acadiana who come to the facility for theater, dance, music performances, gallery open, openings, the wide variety of live performances we offer. Those folks eat and they shop at the, uh, eat at the restaurants and shop at the shops near our facility. Now, I don't have the specific economic impact numbers for CTAT as our loan, but I know that the cultural economy in Louisiana is responsible for $1.5 billion in economic impact, and you all have the data for Lafayette Parish at your hands, thanks to the hard work of Kate Durio, Create, and Lita. In July, Governor Edwards announced that School Mint will be relocating its corporate headquarters to Lafayette. 
And as we attract these new high-tech companies to Lafayette, please be aware that the people who are relocating to Lafayette are coming from uh, places all over the world and this nation who put a much higher premium on the arts funding, the arts and cultural funding than we do. In a city that considers itself a place of celebration and culture, it is unconscionable to privilege one celebration or one art form over the other. Now, for example, a family relocating to Lafayette may expect that because of that one fabulous cultural event they attended, that the city would offer more, from food to music to theater to dance to opera to visual art. While good roads and drainage are important, that is not the main reason that they relocate. A vibrant quality of life and vital cultural assets are just as important, and some studies show more important. A city that has built a brand around cultural celebrations but now entertains reducing funding for the creative talent and the work that goes into cultural creation is effectively stifling free speech and diminishing the opportunities for all people to contribute to the fabric of what makes Lafayette a great place to live, work, and play. Now, in the middle of the last century, as we emerged from the Second World War, and at a time when we still lived in an age of reason, this country emerged as the new superpower, and we wrestled with questions about what that title meant and the responsibilities that were inherent to it. Chief among the questions was, how do we define ourselves as a nation in this new and dangerous age? Well, John F. Kennedy provided the answer to that question in remarks at Amherst College on October 26, 1963, when he eulogized the great American poet Robert Frost. G uh, JFK answers in his opening sentence, our national strength matters, but the spirit which informs and controls our strength matters just as much. And later in the speech, when power leads men towards arrogance, poetry reminds them of his limitations. When power narrows the areas of man's concerns, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. For art establishes the basic human truth, which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. Now, politicians and statesmen of the time came to understand that to avoid the trauma and the atrocities experienced we had just experienced in the war, we needed to embrace our common humanity, acceptance of diversity, the embrace of equality among all people, and the emergent property that makes all of this whole is art. To achieve this, America as a nation, as a world leader, needed to include arts in the government, and Kennedy agreed. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. The highest duty of the writer, the composer, the artist is to remain true to himself and let the chips fall where they may. Well, I came here tonight to serve the vision of my truth, and I'm letting the chips fall where they may. This proposed budget is based on estimations and guesswork that some might call voodoo economics. In fact, the advocate headline of August 10th states the reality. Lafayette July sales taxes almost double the estimate in city's 2020-21 budget. The July sales tax report shows the city collected $7 million, up $200,000 compared with July 2019. We have, in fact, collected more tax revenue in the summer of COVID-19 than last summer, when corona was just something you chased your tequila shot with. So. Um, we have the numbers and the facts at hand. We have the money to fully fund and possibly increase LCG arts and culture grants. So I'm asking you all to please reconsider these cynical, ill-conceived, ill-advised cuts, fully fund LCG in the arts, parks and rec, the nature, the, the science museum, and all of the other cultural institutions you're considering cutting. Thank you very much for your time. Tara Laxey, followed by Bill Leindecker. Good evening, Tara Laxey, Unity 7. Um, first, I want to um, thank Josh, our Mayor Parish President, Carlos Sidra, and my Parish Council member, Mr. Rubin. Unity 7 decided to tackle our, the outside of our recreational centers and um, make them beautiful, try to turn something positive from this negative. And uh, Josh and Carlos, Sidra, and Mr. Rulin came out to the Domain Center yesterday. Josh met my challenge, and I hope this is not the only time that he does it, so I will continuously challenge you. But he came out and he sweated with us, and he showed up with no tie, tennis shoes and a t-shirt. I was pretty much uh, surprised. But for this loud mouth, 
to be able to work side by side with Josh Guillory. There's no I in team. We work together along with other people that came out to help us. Trees were cut back. Uh, pressure washing was done. We painted swing sets, painted a park bench, getting some basketball goals. So with that being said, if we can work together and we can fellowship, we can socialize and just be people together in unity, so can y'all. This is basically our last opportunity to plead to the Joint Council. I need for y'all to step out the box, look at this budget. There's a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Y'all have heard our voices several times. The money is there whenever it comes to park and recreations and these families, these 37 people and their families. I was told one time, why sit at another person's table and eat? You sit at your own table and you invite others to come and eat with you. I need y'all to be our leaders, represent us, truly look at those numbers. They are not right. Y'all should be questioning why we spend over $120,000 to protect the cement slave owner statue. Y'all should really be questioning that. That money can go somewhere else. Why the Sheriff's Department got all that money? And why are they hiring extra people? But yet, we fired 37 Park and Recreation employees. It is, they are not a number. They have faces. They are families, they are children. You're not supposed to steal, period. But what you don't take from, what you don't steal from, is children and the elderly. With all these cuts, it affects our elderly individuals. It affects our children. And with a good conscience, how can y'all sit back and approve this budget coming up in September? <coughs> And that $7.1 million from Bill Cassidy, I was told it was supposed to go for the city buses or whatever. Um, no, it could be used elsewhere also. Use it as a gift. Use it as a gift since we're struggling. Hire back those 37 employees. It's only right. The thing is, is that the budget for these employees that were fired, their, their pay was basically put into that budget last year up until the end of October. So we've let over 100 go before last week and then the 37 Friday. Where is that money at that was included in the budget? And how is it going to be used? Like I, wa I want to know. I want to know where is it at? where it went, how y'all gonna use it. I wanna know that since what Josh, uh, Josh Guillory thought we were going to, I guess, be under budget with COVID and it's pretty much the spending was doubled. What about next month, whenever we get the report for, for August? What are y'all going to do in regards to this budget and represent us? Please sit at your own table. The power of the people is so much stronger than the people in power. I thank y'all for the threat of the rec center's closing because the movement has started. It's not just a moment. Please represent us correctly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Bill Leindecker, followed by Stephanie Skinner. Good afternoon, my name is Bill Leindecker and um, Andy Nakang is my city councilman and Mr. Rubin is my parish councilman. Um, I'm in favor of restoring all the money to parks and recreation, the Hyman Center, the museum, and all the cultural assets. And rehiring all the former employees of those venues and making them full time with all benefits. Uh, I've been out of town for a little while so if there's something that I say that's incorrect, please stop me. One question that I've asked often and I haven't really gotten an answer yet is how much money was actually saved 
by laying off the 37 parks and recreation employees for 10 weeks. Uh, and I, if anybody has that answer, I'd love it, or maybe after the meeting, that's, that's good too, okay? Uh, I do believe there are many other options. Uh, the park police, it's my understanding, they've all found other jobs. So to rehire those other parks and recreation employees would cost significantly less now. If I'm correct, the administration was against the economic development districts because the people did not get to vote on those. The people did vote on create, but the money is unavailable. I'm, I'm unsure why. I am against the sheriff receiving any additional money. Check his budget. I think he has enough money to operate. I would much rather have that money directed to the courthouse for much needed repairs and improvements. Let the sheriff's office stand alone or bring a request to the people. More with less. Is there any way to revisit the LUS director's salary? $262,000 is a lot of money. That's $22,000 a month. $262,000 for a position that's been split in half. I'm probably wrong, but I'm thinking that's more than our mayor president and our CAO make combined. I don't know if that's possibly revisited, but I would certainly request it. Speaking of the LUS director, I would ask the administration to either appoint the interim director as permanent director or begin a search. I really believe it is a great disservice to the current interim director not to know. Last time I spoke before you, I gave a couple of options about reducing expenses and increasing revenue. Okay. Is it possible to look over the budget about LCG vehicles? Sunday I rode past uh, Public Works, uh, the Rosa Parks, and City Hall. There were 45 cars sitting there doing nothing. There were also cars that probably got taken home. And if my figures are correct, some directors get $6,000 per year as a car stipend. Could there be savings there? Can we look at reducing attorney fees? Sometimes we have an attorney sitting there. Sometimes we have an attorney sitting there. Sometimes we have an attorney sitting there. And sometimes we even have guest attorneys. Is there an hourly rate that all these people get paid? I'm sure there is, but I don't know it. Okay. Do they get paid for just being here? Mm -hmm. I found it ironic that last Friday, 37 Parks and Rec employees were laid off, and then I received the document that said through July of this year, LCG paid 37 law firms over $2 million in legal fees. Can we, can we find a better way? To the parish council, I live in the parish. After the budget, can we please focus on ways to increase the parish revenues, decrease parish expenses, and stabilize parish finances? Nothing should be off the table. I've had great conversations with Mr. Rubin and with Mr. Carlson. I think we can do it. Consolidated government might look a little different. Other cities might have to chip in but I have every faith and confidence that you can do it. Finally, City Council, after the budgets are complete, if you'd please focus on the resolution of the LUS, LUS fiber situation. If you think about it, right, all the money that was spent, we're not getting it back. So whatever you're gonna do, please do it. Move on quickly and focus on more important, important issues and please continue to take care of the citizens of the city of Lafayette. Thank you. Thank you. Next Stephanie speaker. Skinner, followed by Wallace Senegal. <laughs> Hi. I have these to pa pass out to the council members.
Hi, I'm Stephanie Skinner Tushin, and I wanted to talk to y'all. I wanted I uh, sent y'all some information. I want to tell everybody, Acadianians and everyone, that we're not going to have a budget because I've heard that the United Nations, and there's proof that the United Nations and Communist China is trying to take over the United States of America. And we have the proof, and I'm passing out to the council members tonight the proof. I had a pamphlet from the John Birch Society, and they've written it down, and it's been a long, elaborate plan, and all we have to do is research United Nations, globalist agenda, you know, agenda 21, agenda 2030. So I want our council members, our mayor, I've dropped off this book to Mayor Josh Guillory behind the green mask, and they wrote down what they plan to do to us. You know, and so we need to be on guard. And I've dropped this book off to the sheriff, into the police, into the mayor, and to a lot of you council members. Some of you might know me. I remember a few of you. And um, I'm glad to be back. And I just want Acadianians to know, you know, what's going on, and that maybe you can work with the governors, and we can keep an eye and make sure that this doesn't come into our state and that we can do our best to defend our state and our country because this is our beautiful state and we won't even be sitting here talking if the UN invades or China invades or communism comes in or this, that, and the other. And another thing, I have a comment really quick on the statue. I know this is about the budget, but I don't believe any statue should be taken down. I mean, I, I don't, so but that's what I have to say. Wallace Senegal, followed by Susan Thiel. Well, good evening again. Good evening. I'm back to talk about a little of the budget. I'm back to talk about some things that we need to start considering about putting in the budget, and one of them is uh, having a uh, elected chief of police instead of appointed chief of police. We could put that in the budget also. You know, Mayor Gary, you and I, we always talking, we consider a lot of things, but now let me put a little politics in this with the 37 people since this is what seemed like the budget is all about, 37 people that been laid off. And I feel like this here. A lot of this stuff is politics. If I knew my vote for you would have caused this disruption in the community of people that need jobs, you wouldn't have gotten my vote. You know, but I gave you my vote, and I feel now with the people that is being laid off the families that is being disrupted, you could almost say I wasted my vote. A lot of things that you're doing for the north side of town is all about politics because maybe you felt the north side didn't vote for you. You're going to take a revenge out on them or on us or however it go. But I'm a part of the North Side, born and raised on the North Side, still live on the North Side, shop on the North Side, pay taxes on the North Side. So now, people on the North Side have voted for you, and I know that. So don't take out because the South Side, or you feel the South Side put you in office, you're going to cut the north side budget. You're going to uh, go against what the north side need in the community or in their community. So I'm just letting you know, no hard feeling, but I feel that my vote counted for you, and you should make sure the vote that I gave you count for the people on the north side of Lafayette, because it's not just me that voted for you 
on the north side. I know other people there too. So remember that. Consider people, their family, their feelings, their kids and everything else. You know, and if you want to be godly, do the right thing with God, not with man. Thank you guys. Okay. Susan Theo, is she still here? Next speaker, uh, Rick Swanson. Rick Swanson, followed by Ann Swanson. Maureen Brennan. Oh, they're coming. Oh, they're running in. Okay. Rick Swanson. Mayor President and members of the City and Parish Councils, my name is Rick Swanson. I live in Andy Knockin City District and Kevin Knockin's Parish District. Thank you for this chance to speak to the proper interpretation of the charter as it relates to the budget. I emailed all of you a more detailed explanation, but we'll summarize here. Also, rather than repeat these remarks at the City Council meeting later, consider these remarks applicable to both meetings. Under well-settled Louisiana law, the interpretation of a home rule charter must be based on the purpose of the charter, as expressed by what is called the will of the electorate that voted for the charter. The primary purpose of the Fix the Charter movement in 2018 was to create a separate city council so as to give the city much more control over its own budget. This was well documented by local media throughout the Fix the Charter campaign in the fall of 2018 and was repeatedly expressed by all the leading supporters of the Fix the Charter movement. Voters relied on these media reports and the statements made by Fix the Charter supporters regarding the primary intended purpose of the new charter. The public, especially city residents, then voted to approve the new charter. Thus, Louisiana law requires that the charter be interpreted in a way consistent with the purpose of the charter, which was, as expressed by the will of the electorate, for much greater city autonomy, especially regarding its budget. By law then, in practice, whenever a provision of the charter is ambiguous on an issue related to city autonomy, or if two provisions of the charter are inconsistent on an issue related to city autonomy, or if the charter is silent on an issue related to city autonomy, the charter must be interpreted to provide for city autonomy, including over its own budget. And also given this is the first budget under the new charter, it's important to set the precedent, the precedent that the city's autonomy will be recognized as the voters intended. As merely one example, the city's parks and recreation budget is entirely funded by a millage that applies only to city taxpayers, and the millage designates its funds will go only to parks and recreation in the city. Under Louisiana law, that millage restriction must be strictly obeyed to fund only parks inside the city limits. Section 504A of the Charter states that amendments to the LCG budget must be passed by both the city and parish councils, except an amendment to the operating budget for a line item of the operating budget or component unit of the city parish government that is funded solely by the city of Lafayette shall be submitted solely to the city of Lafayette for adoption. This clause clearly gives the city exclusive control over the city parks and recreation budget. Even if there were any arguable inconsistency with other provisions of the charter, under Louisiana law, an exception in a law overrides the law's general provisions. And as I just explained, consistent with the purpose of the charter, this clause must be interpreted to give the city exclusive control over its parks and recreation budget. I therefore also support efforts by the city council to hire their own independent attorney to ensure that this, the city is given the autonomy intended by the charter. Such hiring of its own attorney is also allowed under the charter, especially as such hiring would itself be an expression of city autonomy consistent with the purpose of the charter. I would also support and in fact recommend hitting a pause on the budget process until independent legal advice is obtained by the city council. This would also allow more time to adjust the budget for more accurate projections, as we've been hearing in the news lately, there's all kinds of changes in the projections and most of them upwards in revenue. And this would then allow for a rewrite and a rethink of the budget so that it would be more fair across the board. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ann Swanson, followed by Maureen Brennan.
Hello, good evening. My name is Ann Swanson, and I reside in Andy Nakan and Kevin Nakan's respective city and parish districts. So um, I've been having a little traffic jam in my head lately, and I think some of you may be able to empathize with this because there's so much going on. There's so many things at stake with this budget, and it's just hard to even understand and process and then speak about them all. So for example, tonight coming here, here were some questions I had. Do I talk about how important arts and culture is to our way of life and the economy? Do I talk about how important Parks and Rec is for the physical and social well-being and safety of our young people? Or do I go deeper with that and talk about the equity issues of only having the four RFPs for the four parks and recreation centers that are on the side that are in prim primarily African American areas? Do I talk about the 37 employees that were laid off and um, talk about how important restoring the services that they were giving to our citizens, especially at those four parks, are. Do I talk about how sad it makes me to see how our seniors have been disregarded through this budget process? And science, the Science Museum, do I talk about that? Um, I could continue, uh, but I think we've, we're all there. We're all there right now. And um, oh, another thing is the, the financials that we're seeing, that we're seeing that the budget, the way it was projected, there is very likely going to be more money than was projected based on the July sales tax revenue. We have the CREATE funding. Um, we have the CARES funding. There's so many things to try to figure out with this budget. And so what I would like to ask the council to do tonight is to hit pause and to um, take a step back and look closer at what's going on with this budget. Um, what I want to encourage the city to do, uh, in lieu of coming and speaking later, I'll just say it here during this part of the public comment, to please hire your own attorney to sit down and go through this budget, this process, and the inequities of having city money, money that was designated for the city that has control over it by the parish. And so um, thank you for all you do. Thank you for your service. And um, that is all for me tonight. Thank you very much. Maureen Brennan, followed by Claire Harrington. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to visit with you all. Uh, my name is Maureen Brennan. I'm a, a clinical psychologist by trade, uh, an art supporter, and the founder and executive director of Cité des Arts. I've lived a little bit of everywhere, uh, landed here over 40 years ago, and I can't leave. Uh, I love it. I love the culture. Um, nowhere else other than Acadiana have I been in a region where there was the breadth of arts and culture that we have here. And so I want to focus on that tonight. And there was a time when Lafayette was known ah, for its music, but now it's recognized for much more than that. We have local artists, musicians, dancers, writers, you name it. They're recognized here and they're recognized across the country and many outside the country. But we must support our artists and we must grow the talent. We cannot sit by and watch them fade away. Part of our job at CTA is to nurture these artists. Uh, it's always rewarding to see new art created, to see art related businesses come out of CTA, to see young producers learn how to develop, to develop new plays and bring them to life. Mr. Gallery, I know that you grew up in a musical family 
and that your children have apparently inherited some of that uh, talent. Uh, my children and grandchildren didn't have much chance to get any uh, great uh, talent from me, but they did have the opportunity to become involved into the arts here. Uh, they were involved in dance, in theater, in film, and music. My concern today is the fact that there is less and less opportunity in this town for children, and for adults also for that matter, to partake in the local arts and culture, whether as an audience member or a participant. We know that exposure to the arts is not just a hobby. We know that exposure to the arts contributes greatly to an individual's ability to develop skills such as critical thinking, uh, the ability to communicate with others, to be introspective, and to connect, connect with other people. These all may be abstract issues, but they are important, they are critical in a young child's ability to achieve higher grades and for us as adults to become more successful and productive citizens. I know, for instance, as a therapist, that individuals who find their own voice come out to be much more functional individuals. How does that relate to the budget? I know, I'm guessing, <laughs> that repairing a mile of a road is, what, over $500,000 or so. And indeed, there are existing millages for such roads, and I vote for them also. I've had a few rough Louisiana roads to live on. But there's also a, been a legitimate vote by citizens to support culture and recreation and this also needs to be honored. Over the years, the amount of funds available for nonprofits, for instance, the LCG grants, has been in a strong and steady decline, even as our costs escalate. We urge you to take a look at that slope and how and why that is happening. We do know that there is money available in the CREATE account. And this is money that was set aside by vote, voters. Uh, also, according to the advocate on August 10th. Ma'am, I hate to cut you off. That's your five minutes. All right. Okay. Uh, I want to be sure that. Ma'am, <laughs> no problem. Next speaker, Claire Harrington, followed by Paulette LaMail. Hello, my name is Claire Harrington and I'm a junior at Lafayette High. This will be my sixth year in the 4-H program and every year gets better. 4-H has allowed me to share my talents and improve my leadership and public speaking skills. Because of this program, I now know how to solve problems that come my way. Our agents and the friends that I have made within 4-H have led me to be a better friend and person. 4-H and the people I have met along the way have made me the person you see in front of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paulette LaMeo, followed by Deke, and I'll let him say his last name. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paulette LaMeo. I'm a retired educator, and I'm here because my heart is full and I'm sad for our city of Lafayette. I have several questions and I have several comments. Why would you allow a building to be opened and get rid of the people who maintain it? Why would we think that these buildings would function without the staff? How can the council allow such raises when we're saying that we're short of funds. 
Lafayette draws a lot of tourists, and a lot of the tourists park in Acadiana Park. Are we saying that we want to get rid of the tourists? How can Lafayette get better if you only address the needs of certain sections of the city? How can you as a council accept such a bu budget? Council members, please put some binders on or some binoculars if you cannot see what is going on with this budget. <laughs> what is more important to our community? Are we supposed to represent the people here? It is essential that we consider the cultural arts here and the tours that we, we bring here and the people that love to come in to Lafayette. Are we saying that we're forgetting about tourism now? Do we want tourism in Lafayette to go down? What is more important, maintaining our current facilities and our current activities or increasing the funds of golf courses and the shelves budget? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mill. Next speaker. Deke, followed by Dave Halstetter. And my apologies on your name, if you could say your name for the record. No problem. My name is uh, Deke DeCaliga. Uh, I am uh, a current resident of Lafayette. Um, I've been a resident of Lafayette for 38 years, uh, currently located in Parish District 1 and City District 2. Um, I'm also the current president of the Lafayette Science Museum Foundation. Um, I want to give you a brief history on an organization. Uh, in 1952, 24 civic-minded women started a mission to form an organization and, and, and create funds to build a museum for Lafayette. Um, that happened in 1969, and uh, that work led to what we have today, which is the state's uh, only dedicated science museum that ther serves thousands of visitors and uh, hundreds of thousands of local school kids every year. Uh, it also sparked the creation for the Lafayette Science Museum Foundation, of which I am current uh, board of directors president. Um, currently, we are uh, five volunteers, myself and four other volunteers. Um, we work in close partnership with that original group of ladies uh, who formed the organization Led du Duzain. Um, the foundation uh, is committed to generating revenue to supplement monies budgeted by LCG for support of the museum and planetarium activities. Um, we have done so by corporate and private sponsorships, uh, partnerships with local area businesses and organizations, as well as fundraisers, such as our Bach Lunch Concert Series, which just celebrated its 30th annual season. Um, over the past several weeks, the foundation's been diligently meeting and researching a plan to save our only benefactor, the Lafayette Science Museum, um, because of the extreme LCG budget cuts. We've met and worked closely with Mr. Hollis Conway, our museum's director, to formulate a plan. And that plan initially has been for the foundation to take over operational control of the Science Museum. Ultimately, the foundation currently lacks adequate financial and human resources to support such a large operational change in such a short period of time. We as the foundation wish to continue our mission and continue building upon the relationships and partnerships that we've created in the last few weeks with LCG, as well as those we've been formed with our past board members over 30 plus years of dedicated service to our community and our community's premier science and education center. It's the request of uh, LSM Foundation that the council reinstate the LSM budget for the 2021 fiscal year in order for the foundation to continue its mission and see that LSM becomes financially self-sufficient in the coming years. Without that funding, the Lafayette Science Museum will be unable to reopen to the public and ultimately the community will lose its largest asset to science education. I invite each of you to reach out to me in order to continue our partnership. My email is president at lsmfoundation.com. And we also plan to have an online fundraising um, information out on our website by the end of this week. Anyone wishing to contribute to the museum can email me or visit our website, lsmfoundation.com in the coming days. Um, I'd like to close with my personal comments. My father, who was an engineer, um, also a Lafayette resident, was involved in the Apollo space missions. 
it's an understatement to say that science and ultimately the Lafayette Science Museum shaped my youth and my education. Now I operate a technology business right here in Lafayette, in addition to volunteering on the LSM uh, Foundation Board. I want my children to experience the same things. If we continue the path of this budget, devaluing arts, culture, recreation, and education, that will affect my decision to stay and raise my children here in Lafayette. If we don't put money and value on services dedicated to people, all people, regardless of race, gender, socioeconomic status, Lafayette will ultimately lose and fall behind every other culture rich city in the United States. Science and culture are not different entities. Science is part of culture, and how science is done largely depends on the culture in which it's practiced. The Lafayette Science Museum has showcased this over many years, but most recently, merging it with technology. For example, we gave visitors a swamp tour, a crawfish boil, and taste of a festival international with our most recent virtual reality experience uh, exhibit in partnership with One Acadiana. Our culture is very important here in Lafayette. It's one that I'm very proud to have been raised in, and it must be preserved in every possible form. Please reinstate all the arts and culture budget budgets, including the Science Museum budget, so that all the partnerships and foundations that have already worked so hard to provide for their causes can work Mr. in D. partnership. Sir, that's yes. A that's the five your, time, your time is ended. I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the, the clock, clock is, didn't work. I guess it's not working. Or Thank you so much. We've got to reset it, D. Okay. All right. Needs new batteries? Do we have that in the budget? <laughs> Allison Brandon is next. After Mr. Hostetter. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Hostetter. Uh, I was the curator of the planetarium at the Lafayette Science Museum for 40 years prior to the recent cutbacks and, and layoffs and chose to retire while I could. And I gotta be honest, I don't envy you the job you have in determining what to do with the budget because Lafayette really does have a serious budget problem and you're gonna have to make a lot of decisions. The museum's gonna have to bear its share. But I think that what's been suggested so far is more than its share. Irish poet Oscar Wilde once wrote about people who knew the price of everything but the value of nothing. And I'd like to talk about the cost of the museum and its value, which I think is much harder to put on a balance sheet. Now, I have here a stony meteorite, a rock from space. I got it about a dozen years ago as a door prize at a regional planetarium conference. It was free, but if I bought it, I would have spent about 50 bucks. I've loaned it to the museum ever since. Along with an iron meteorite, we have passed it around to most of the school programs that we do. And uh, we've invited audiences after public planetarium programs to come up and see and handle the meteorite. During that dozen years or so, we have probably had about, conservative, conservatively speaking, 200,000 people go through the planetarium theater. Um, some of them for school, some of them for public. And again, conservatively, about a third of them have handled this meteorite. So that's about 70,000 people. That's 70,000 people who got to hold a rock from space, and you should have seen the excitement that often generated. Another 70,000 people who learned a little bit about Earth's space environment, 70,000 people who learned how scientists learn about the solar system from meteorites, 70,000 people who thought about something that day that was way bigger than themselves, 70,000 people probably did not expect to do any of that when they woke up this morning. And that, I think, is a lot of return for a, five, for a $50 rock. And I think that's part of the main value of the Lafayette Science Museum. It's a place where families and other people could have experiences they can't have anywhere else. And yes, you can find pictures of meteorites on the internet. You can read about them on a book. But you've got to go to the Lafayette Science Museum in order to hold this rock that spent probably millions, if not tens of millions of years in space before falling to Earth, type of process that actually formed our planet and is still going on today. Now, there's another aspect of the family experience at the Lafayette Science Museum. During the last decade or so of my career, I started meeting people who told me that they had come to the museum and seen the planetarium program when they were children, and now they were bringing their children. I even talked to some people who said that they had brought their children, and now they were bringing their grandchildren. 
If the museum ends up closing or is reduced to irrelevancy, that nice bit of shared generational experience will end in Lafayette. And the Lafayette Science Museum, to my knowledge, is the only museum in the state solely dedicated to science itself. I think its value is far more than its operating cost, and I think that needs to be taken into account. Back during the American Revolution, there was a member of parliament named Edmund Burke, one of the few members who actually thought the Americans might have some legitimate complaints. And there's a quote of his that I like so much that I had it hanging on my wall in my planetarium office for many years. He said, the public interest requires doing today those things that men of intelligence and goodwill would wish five or 10 years hence had been done. In my opinion, in five or 10 years, people of goodwill in Lafayette will not be happy if the museum and other cultural and recreational facilities are ruined on your watch. Please don't do that. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker, please. Jackie Loud, followed by John Pastor. I'm sorry, Allison Brandon, and then it's Jackie Loud. Okay. Hello, council members, Mayor President. My name is Allison Baron Brandon. I just want to come before you and speak up on behalf of the arts in our community. I was born and raised in Lafayette, and I'm raising my family here. I grew up as a dancer. I performed annually at the Hyman Center as a child. I now, as of recent events, hold a seat on the Performing Arts Center Commission, so thank you for allowing me to hold this position. I'm here to speak on behalf of the budget supporting the Hyman Center, along with the other community organizations that are being threatened. I'm here to tell you why it's so important. Dance shaped my life. Community and public school choir shaped my life. I attended ULL for performing arts and theater. I went on to UNO to obtain my master's degree in arts administration. I am telling you all of this so you know, I've invested my life in the arts. The skills I gained from my time studying and participating in the arts make me the innovative problem solver I am today. Today I'm the, found, the proud founder and president of Wonderland Performing Arts, where my team and I offer arts education, events, productions, and experiences. The arts are vital to our culture and our community, and therefore unarguably vital to our economy. When my company or any company produces a show, be it a musical, a play, a dance review, a concert, etc., the trickle-down effect of the economic stimulation is inevitable. People putting the shows together are employing people to build costumes, sets, props, design lighting and sound. We're buying fabric and materials to build sets and props. We're selling tickets. We're allowing performers a chance to perform for their community, family, and friends. Those audience members likely patronize restaurants to eat before or after the show, and they will purchase flowers and gifts for the performers. They will perhaps purchase a new outfit to attend the theater because it's a special occasion. Live theater, dance, and music are essential to our way of life in Lafayette. It allows us to connect and it inspires us to be better and do greater things. The arts not only have positive economic effects, but they help us on a much deeper level as well. Stories help us understand one another. They may open our eyes to see things we haven't seen or experienced before. I would like to draw your attention to all the industries that rely on skills that are learned from participating in the arts. It isn't just painting and music and plays. Designers of all kinds, marketers, web designers, people who create logos, design jewelry and clothing, architects, engineers, just to name a few. They all need creativity and vision, which is learned from the arts. The arts reach far and wide. They are rooted deep in our nature as creative, smart human beings. The arts are not charity. They are not a want. The arts are a need. I want to live in a place that has a thriving arts community. We all want that, we just may not realize it day to day. We artists and art-centric business owners need support from our leaders. I think a Lafayette suffering from budget cuts in the areas of the arts will be a very sad Lafayette. It will drive away talent to move to other cities and therefore will have a negative overall effect on our economy. I understand that you may that you have many difficult decisions in front of you. You may not immediately see the results of the decisions you're making today, but I would like to leave you with this. The effects of not investing in our arts and culture will absolutely have great lasting and devastating effects on us all. I just ask you to please reconsider cutting the portion of the budget that supports the arts, the Hyman Center, and additionally our recreation centers and the Science Museum in our community. These institutions are imperative to our thriving, creative, and innovative existence. Jackie Lau, followed by John Pastor. Good evening. 
I'm Jackie Lyle. Um, I'm a resident of Lafayette Parish. And if you don't know if I live in your district, I live in the same house as Conrad Como. So you can always find me there. The mayor has slashed funding of staff at the Hyman Performing Arts Center from $548,096 to $187,114, a reduction that will leave only minimal staffing at the Hyman. The current budget also has zeroed out the 1920 budgeted amounts for overtime and temporary help at the Hyman, another $131,000. $576 cut. In total, staffing expenditures of $679,672 in fiscal year 1920 have been reduced by 73% to only $187,114 for the new budget year that begins November 1st. Keep in mind how important overtime and temporary help are during the Hyman's heaviest season, the dance recital season. All staffing related funds are necessary to operate a competent venue. I speak from an informed position. I've brought more than 300 shows to the Hyman Center. I've produced work for UL there. I have produced new work for Parsons Dance Company, for Elisa Monte Dance Company, for the world famous Apollo Theater located in New York City, and for GNS Productions in Los Angeles. These budget cuts have a negative impact on events at the Hyman Center. Janitorial chairs, tables, and other rentals, everything will have to be outsourced through a third party private enterprise, driving cost up to unsustainable amounts for an already risky industry. The Hyman Performing Arts Center in its earlier days known as Lafayette Municipal Auditorium was built as an asset for citizens operated at taxpayers' expense. These dollars are still in place. While the Hyman's budget has been slashed, threatening the future of community and live entertainment events, the three government-owned golf courses are subsidized in the mayor's budget, although that subsidy is sort of tucked away in a weird place. Um, with more than $918,000 from the general fund. Further, the golf courses will get an additional $500,000 from the capital improvements budget for a total of $1,418,000, more than double the amount that the Hyman Center has been cut. How is it that a cultural asset that attracts more than 100,000 people a year can fall prey to this fake crisis? The Hyman Performing Arts Center, with events that generate significant tax and millions of dollars in economic activity in restaurants, retail stores, the service industry, hotels and beyond, more than makes up the amount of general fund monies that are required to keep it a professionally staffed venue. This is as important to our community's psychosocial health as it is to our economic health. On behalf of the PASA board, we support the full restoration of funding for staffing at the Hyman Performing Arts Center, including funding for full-time positions, overtime pay, and temporary help. We recognize that staff is not needed at the Hyman Center until activity begins again, but please reallocate these funds so that the necessary funds are in place when the coast is clear and we can continue performances again. These closures of the Hyman Center, the Lafayette Science Museum, the Acadiana Nature Station, and the Senior Citizen Centers have shined a spotlight on long-standing problems that have existed for decades. So, yay to that. We are at a crossroads and what better time to resolve these issues than now. Use this unfortunate time to consolidate the arts community by creating an arts commission or an arts task force. We have never had this representation, this examination, or this process. We need the greater conversation that should also include the Parks and Recreation Department. I am available at any time to provide anybody with professional information about how you run a performing arts center. Please call me. Our phone number is in the phone book under Conrad Como. And my email address is JackieLyle at gmail.com. No dot, no space, no underscore, no hyphen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, speakers left. John Pastor, followed by Kate Durio. Oh. 
John Pastor. Okay, so the Kate Durio. Followed by uh, Herman Simon. Mr. Herman? She'll go first, and then you'll go next. No, ma'am. No, <laughs> they both back in. <laughs> Kate, come up to the front. <laughs> I don't know. I got some serious problems. My earring stuck on my mask. Y'all can relate. Um, good evening, council members. My name is Kate Durio. I'm going to read again because that helps me keep my thoughts organized. I'm a local business owner, a city resident in Councilman Lazard's district, and a parish resident in Councilman Rubin's district. I'm a big fan of public process, why I'm here, and I commend you all for serving your constituents. As someone who's been in and around council meetings for years, first as a citizen, volunteer, and then as staff, I return tonight once again as a citizen with a more educated perspective on our local government, budget, and public perception. And in all of that experience, this is the most upset I've ever seen the people of the city and parish of Laf and city and P parish of Lafayette. But rightfully so, and I stand with them. It's mostly the city residents like myself who are upset because they don't believe this budget is presented as fair or appropriate, and it certainly doesn't reflect what we as the people want, which is why I come to you. This is your budget as our council members. This may have started as an administrative proposal after what feels like years, but has only been eight months of a failed but handsomely paid administrative team. And I say that as someone who was once on that administrative team, and from my experience, I have to ask what has happened. We didn't always see eye to eye, but we always worked together. We always wanted what's best for the most amount of people, regardless of race, council district, or financial contributions to campaigns. The budget was not the weapon, of divisiveness used to pick sides as it is now in this administration, but was a modest means to fund the things we had to and leave something to fund the things we know build us the most revenue through a healthy public discourse. That is not what's happening in this budget process. The people are right to be upset because our economic development recipe is to incentivize and provide infrastructure to subsidize big box retailers in the millions of dollars while we continue to see a march of the dead in each and every relic of failed big box economic development plans, such as the Walmart on the north side. These big boxers don't care about Lafayette. They come in and squeeze as much money out of us as they can, kill local competitive businesses while offering the lowest paying jobs and then leave us with a giant hole with no remorse and have nothing but an empty hole to show for it. This shouldn't be news, but I won't fault anyone for not realizing this before, but our culture is 100% local businesses. There is no culture corporation. It's truly our cultural and community economy. There is no competition, unlike big boxes. We are at a crucial crossroads right now with, us, with this budget. I invite you to ask yourselves if you want to be the council who further divides us with these unnecessary and draconian cuts to the things that make up our culture and recreation, or if you want to be the council with a vision that takes Lafayette down the path toward growth, prosperity, jobs, and innovation by investing in the infrastructure that gets us there. Do you think it is a better use of create money to create the illusion that the cultural shell that once was a booming and cultural economy is still booming through expensive smoke and mirrors? Or do you think it's smarter to simply invest in what makes our culture strong in the first place so we have something to market? This administration only cares about press releases and photo ops. They aren't committed to the actual work or taking the time to understand what's going on to generate good news and a booming economy. I hope I'm right in thinking that you see things differently and are committed to doing the hard work. The fact of the matter is that this budget projection revenues are false. I know they're false, you know they're false. Anyone who takes the time to read is seeing behind the curtain and can clearly see that the emperor has no clothes. These numbers were conjured up to, as a stunt to justify the cuts to who we are as a community. I am here tonight also because I fear that dangerous precedents are being set related to our city and parish budgets. Despite what you've been told, city-funded line items and city-funded component parts are the exclusive purview of the city council, and I have confidence that the newly hired city attorney will identify that in her first memo. And I urge you to move that process forward so that our city can make needed investments we know our city tax dollars can stay in our city. 
Lastly, as a relative veteran to the budget process and the day-to-day -day dealings as an LCG staff, I see that these five-minute soliloquies of all of these vital assets and organizations in need of support after needlessly being slashed is not the most efficient approach to the very complicated and long time coming conversation of how to support our culture and recreation economies. Voters found it so important they approved this measure to support CREATE for the express purpose of, and I quote the millage, for the purpose of providing, establishing, operating, improving, and expanding public facilities and programs to foster and enhance the parish's culture, recreation, entertainment, arts, tourism, and the respective economies. I share this full text to go on record with the correction from the CFO's missing information in her budget presentation last week. As someone who has worked and volunteered in this local cultural sector, I know it's going to be very hard and it's gonna take a lot of conversation to solve, but I'm here to help and I wanna offer myself as a resource again. And I thank you for your time. Herman, Herman Simo, Herman Simo, or Simon, and followed by Albert Johnson. Well, he will follow. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? I appreciate y'all allowing me to speak, and young lady, you have answered all of the questions. I thank you. This is what I have to say. I don't know which one of y'all is Josh Guidry, but I, I know he's not sitting here. He ain't here, right? Right. So all the things this young lady just said, which is it's, it's, it's meaning, so he's behind the door now, all right? So the real thing is, see, I'm not about politician, y'all. I'm not. I don't put my wife, up. I have my wife over here, y'all, and this is from my heart. I have my wife over here now and the COVID-19 going on in her condition. And I'm an old country boy. And he shut down the, the north side. Then I seen him on the news painting and pressure washing and said, and one of his co-workers had said, well, if y'all got to put in, you know, y'all put in or set up. I heard it on the news. All right. He want to do something that's, he didn't done that. The city of Lafayette didn't do it. Our tax money did it. I pay taxes just like y'all, and I'm not dressed up like y'all. I don't have what y'all have. But y'all supposed to be out my leader. I don't mind doing the footwork. I don't mind going knock on the doors, say y'all registered to vote. Whoever y'all vote for, that's on y'all. But I tell you what, it's a hurting thing. If my mom and dad was alive right now, I wouldn't know how they, they would cope with it. People, we are the people. We are the people. We the one that make the tax. They take my tax money. Do that much as they take y'all. That's right. I pay taxes, regardless by my clothes. But the clothes don't make me. I got grandkids. I, I, I'm over here for my grandchildren. Yes. I'm not here for me and my wife, Captain Simon. I'm here for my grandkids, for the future, y'all. We voted y'all in there, like Judge Khalid Kaloon said. We put y'all, if you gonna do something stupid, Judge Khalid Kaloon will say he putting you in the jailhouse. I remember that old man, and I topped my head off to him, because that old man was real. Where y'all at? Where the real people at? It's not about the color no more. It's not about the color, y'all. It's about your heart. Yes. Search your heart. And everybody inside this place right here. And y'all know better. We all know better. That's right. Y'all send your kids to school. Y'all know those kids going to get sick. Can those children quarantine themselves? Where they going at? Mama going to take care of the kids. Mama is not about politics no more. It's about love, y'all. We got to read. Look, I was brought up in the 60s. 
I was brought up in the 60s. I was brought up deep, sharecropping. My dad was a sharecropper all his life. $500 a week, a month, a year, and split it down the middle. And now all that money, since I was, I'm 61 years old, where all my tax money at? And you're sitting down the north side? They don't have no more grocery store on the north side. How about the old people that don't have no cars? Yes. They got to go with a wheelchair, bro. You know what I'm saying? Some of their grandkids don't want to listen no more because you know the children got a hard head. Y'all know that. We all know that. Look, I'm not a politician. I don't know a darn thing about politicians. But my heart, y'all, I swear to God, my heart, my heart is hurting. I watch it on the news. I want y'all to feel me. I watch it on the news. And I trouble my wife, my little poor wife. Listen to me. And I say, babe, I'm shutting this down today, this project down. I say, I have to participate in their meeting. We got to feel it to one another, y'all. We got to put out, we all going to have a difference. Mr. Simon, your okay. time has ended. <laughs> Albert Johnson. Albert Johnson followed by Daryl Benjamin. Good evening. Mr. Nakin, both Ms. Cooks, and I don't know if Ms. Abair, if you can hear me. I'm pleading to you guys to seriously consider. Um, I'm going to piggyback on some of the people here for our arts and culture, because uh, that's what it's all about. That's, that's going to help us out with our infrastructure. We do need to seriously reconsider and get a staff back there in these recreational centers. We do really seriously need to create a uh, task force to make sure something like that. I know you guys came in on a, a, a millage that was just, you know, just tumbling out of control and it's out of control. You don't know how I, I feel the fear. But to, to piggyback on something you said, yeah, it's not 19, it's not 1969 or 1970. It's 2021. We need the forward thinking on this thing, on how Lafayette can be successful, and uh, and we, we 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 thrive on our culture. We thrive on our festivals. Most of you guys, I see you at the international festival, uh, with a little uh, enjoying yourself, libations and all. So those things bring us closer, man. I, I mean, I can be with you guys and <laughs> between a drink or two, we're, we're the best friends. So those things, those things add value to Lafayette. It, it, it's the value. It's, it's not what we can make and how we're going to do this thing. We definitely need to seriously reconsider adding these jobs back, adding the, uh, a director. For, of course, let's, let's, let's hire a director, a recreational director, and um, so we can, we, can, we can grow this thing. Also, I got a couple of notes right here. Uh, well, pretty much, you know, those things uh, for the recreationals and, and uh, recreation and, and Kevin was here, said something to me uh, two weeks, a week ago. But my thing wasn't about let's, let's, let's create something to get rich. No, let's create something so it can be self-sufficient because let's go back 40 years ago. <laughs> it was self-sufficient when there were events, non-sport events as a child. We went on all these field trips. You did have to pay $25 to the recreational center. I remember that. So those things can add value. We, we need to put the money into these recreational centers so it can help out with all the millages too, the taxes and all this stuff. Because I, I, I get it. You, you know, you stepped into something, uh, probably let's go back 2011 or whatever, when stuff really started falling out of place, falling out of place. And it's, and it's, and it's, I'm gonna use an adjective now. It's the shit now, you know. And, and God damn, it was a delight. Uh, it it it's it's not good. So we have to not take away from our culture so we can save some money for our pockets. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to my local uh, 
councilmen in our district too. It's we leaving it up to you guys because we did vote for you, uh, Patrick Lewis. We did vote for you, man. We did vote for our guys that of ethno uh, back background to thinking that these guys are going to have our back. It, we definitely need everybody on. I remember you saying that why put in money where. Why put in money in places where we haven't been putting in money here? Because the money has been taken out. We, it's, it's been, as you see on your records, that money has been taken out, taken out, taken out, you know, and, and they keep on forgetting about the north side. But the north side is Lafayette. It's the first thing you see when you come into Lafayette regardless of how you feel about this side of town or the other side of town, it's the first thing. And as I see for the last three years that the entry of coming into Lafayette is going down. You know, there was murals underneath the uh, drive through uh, bridge area. Those things have faded away. You had a task force to go and clean those things. That stopped. You cut that budget. So we're, we're cutting budgets that's going to keep our town <laughs> beautiful to turn it into an ugly uh, something of 1960s, right? We don't need to have mattresses and broken bottles and all different of the wrong elements here, you know, because if it's crime in one area, the crime is going to go to your area. Trust me. So if we can focus on getting these budgets and getting everything, reconsider our recreational centers and every activity center here in Lafayette as one culture and as something that belongs to us, we can be successful. Let's get a director back there. Let's get these 37 people's their jobs back and let us uh, create a task for it. That's all I have. Thank you. Daryl Benjamin. And he will be followed by Susan Davi. My name is Daryl Benjamin. This is my second time coming here. The first time I was escorted out by Mr. Aguilar, seeing that he was going to check on the incident that I had with the police department. I don't want to support the police department budget because they don't do the north side the way they do the south side. Lafayette Police Department came to my house with no OPC order. I had no idea what it was grabbed me by my hand while I'm dialing 911, slammed me to the ground, choked me, had a foot in my back, bending me like I'm a barn arrow or something. Then when they picked me up, I could hear the bones cracking in my shoulder. I'm asking, these, I'm telling these people, hold up, hold up. All I heard from the police department is, you had your turn. They threw me in the back of that car like I was a sack of potato. And then they lied on the body cam. I finally got a copy of the body cam. I couldn't get it. I got it October this year. I just got out of the hospital with a heart attack. And that's because of them too. The incident happened in August. What was it? December. I had my first stint. January, I had another stint. And by July, I had an open heart surgery because I can't sleep worrying about these damn criminal Y'all call policemen. How y'all want policemen to police us when they can't even police themselves? Yes. When they all get together and lie for each other. Yes. I called Aguilar on the phone. Well, not Aguilar. Aguilar took me out of here. I called Reggie, which was after Aguilar, on the phone. I told Reggie what happened. Being a black man in that position, I figured he could get that king, put it in there, see what happened. But he didn't, and now he in my neighborhood asking for my support. I, I can't tell y'all what I told him when I seen him, and I never realized how mad I was at the police officers till that day. So why y'all want us to support people that don't support us? Instead of pulling out their guns and jumping on the people they need to put on the body cam, and that don't do no good because they alter that. We paid them to lie on us because they did something wrong. I went to federal court because I came here and I tried to tell y'all my story. 
didn't have a chance to do it, I was out of here. They telling me I can't even get a court appointed lawyer. I had to defend myself. I went in the rain in this chair from Truman to here. Then turn around, I go back in 30 days. It wasn't even about going to court then. It was about filling out some paperwork. If I couldn't find a lawyer, I had to defend myself. They wouldn't even let my sister them write, fill out the paperwork for me because I don't have no control of my hands. So don't tell me about Lafayette and the police department. I'd rather deal with the mob. At least I know I'm in a dirty game and I might get killed. When the, when the, the tree up across the street from our house fell, they had a door on there. When they took that door off, I swear to God, I worried. Every time I opened that door, some damn policeman was going to be on the other side wanting to shoot me because I'm worth more dead than alive. Now, you really stop and think about this. If they all turned body cams and all that junk for me and three men on one man with one leg, what you think they're going to do to the rest of the people? What you think they did with the rest of my neighbors? Why you think they had a cop come right after that killer shot a guy in my neighborhood off a of Carver and nobody had a body cam on? That makes sense to y'all? And that's what y'all want the people to support? I went the other day, and a man that's in this place right now came with me right there to the police station. I asked for the internal affairs papers. They gave me a piece of paper from Aguilard saying that they investigated, everything's okay. I didn't want nothing from Aguilard. I wanted the paper from internal affairs. Why I can't get the papers? They're telling me I need a lawyer to get the papers from internal affairs. The Sixth Amendment don't say that. So y'all tell me, do we have a police department or we just have a crime unit that do things to anybody any way they feel fit? All I got to say. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, Next speaker is Susan Davi, followed by William Teeley. Ms. Davi, you may begin speaking. for the Arts and Culture Grant. It has allowed our agency to stay open for, we're going on 10 years now, and that's a really big deal for me and uh, for the agency because we support the arts and we believe it's a very important and crucial aspect to the culture and to our region and think that that is why a lot people like to visit this area. It's an opportunity for tourism and for education and for delight. Uh, so uh, I have cause for worry about the proposed budget cuts and would hope that that's not something that is actually on the chopping block, so to speak, with the decision tonight. I think that in a way, some of these things could be salvaged and maybe not ship that so acutely and quickly. Uh, I think that the art sometimes gets cut first, but that's really what we need to be a better society. So I would request that you maybe consider this my suggestion to not cut the budget for the arts and culture grant, that it would put a lot of small agencies like myself and other arts educational agencies at risk for having to close their doors. That's, that's all I have to say. I really do thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Next speaker is William Teeley. You may begin speaking, Mr. Teeley. Hello, my name is Will Teeley. I live in City District 2, Parish District 5. Councilman Andy Nakin and A.B. Rubin represent me, so thank you to them and thank you to everyone on both councils. Two years ago, the voters approved a new home rule charter that split the City Parish Council into a City of Lafayette Council and a Parish of Lafayette Council. And now, here we are, our first budget process under this new form of government. And frankly, I have concerns on how everything has been handled. What we are doing here, whether we like it or not, is setting precedent for our new form of government. Future city and parish councils will look to what we're doing now for guidance on how to operate our new government. To put the issue frankly, we cannot get this wrong. I would like to address three main concerns I have with the budget. First, I'm concerned we are not properly executing on the new Home Rule Charter. I have numerous examples. First, we let parish councilmen object to city-only budget amendments. Second, parish, the parish council was given the opportunity to not second an emergency ordinance that had nothing to do with the parish. And third, we potentially could have an issue in the upcoming weeks where the parish council is allowed to prevent the city council from overriding a mayoral veto on a city-only issue. These issues are all troubling and setting terrible precedent that the, La the city and parish of Lafayette will have to live with until the days we adopt a new Home Rule Charter. Parish Council, my message to you, you need to treat the Lafayette City Council with more respect. You don't object when the city of Youngsville passes a new tax. You don't object when the city of Karen Crow passes a new ordinance. But when the city of Lafayette wants to save their rec centers with city-only money, you then suddenly object? No. You must show the city of Lafayette Council the same respect and autonomy you show the city councils of Scott, Karen Crow, Youngsville, Broussard, and all the rest. My second issue. I'm concerned about the allocation formulas listed out on pages 54 and 55 of the budget. The parish is robbing the city with the 7921 allocation formula, which most departments of LCG use. This allocation formula is not based in reality in any way. It's not based on some sort of determination of the value of services the city or the parish receives. It's based on a socialist idea that because the parish is so broke, the parish is allowed to pay whatever it can afford to pay and the city has to pick up the rest of the tab. That's clearly not fair. I need the city council right here, right now, to propose a budget amendment to change every department's use of allocation formula number six, which is the pay what you can afford to pay 7921 allocation formula, to instead be allocation formula 21, which is based on population, 5248, which is much more fair. And don't let Miss Lori Toops tell you that in order for you to change an allocation formula, you must also explain how the parish is going to pay for it and not go into the negative. It would be inappropriate and illegal for the Lafayette City Council to make any Parish of Lafayette Council budget decision. The Parish Council will explain how they will balance their books once the allocation formula has been changed. Third, the Northside Rec Centers represent the City of Lafayette's greatest budget priority, even above drainage. Citizen engagement has been activated like never before regarding these rec centers. If the City Council isn't prepared to deliver on saving these rec centers from the Mayor President's attempt at privatization, then the City Council isn't fighting for the City of Lafayette. Likewise, the Science Museum, the Hyman Center, the Nature Station, the ACA, Festival International, all of these need more support than current budget amendments allow. Please, purport, please propose more amendments to save these entities. Please protect city dollars like it was the reason you were elected, because it was the reason you were elected. Thank you for letting me speak. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Next.
Next speaker is Glenn Fields. Mr. Fields, you may begin speaking. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to all the council members and the uh, president for allowing me to speak on the issue of uh, possibly uh, reducing the LCG culture grants. Um, in 2006, I started a festival called the Black Fox Festival, which uh, has, it, it's still going. We're, we're celebrating what well, we would have celebrated our 16th year this year. We were able to use these LTG grants to, uh, in my opinion, great effect by um, turning those dollars into uh, uh, bands to draw people to our festival, using them to produce merchandise. Uh, that we can then sell uh, at the festival. And we've brought people from all over the world to right here in Lafayette, uh, which also brought tax revenue to the city. Uh, it, it's my opinion that these uh, grants, these cultural grants, uh, produce uh, dollars for uh, not only the uh, community at large through tax, uh, but also um, keep our you know, musicians funded, keep the festivals running, and bring people uh, to Lafayette, which uh, in this day and age when we're having a hard time breaking industry and businesses here, uh, we need those tourism dollars uh, to um, keep the doors open here. So uh, that's just it. I'm just lending my voice to the other people that are uh, that are there to, to speak on behalf of this issue. So thank you for your time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Four more speakers. Next speaker is Aaron Lysik. Ms. Lysik, you may begin speaking. Hi, thank you. My name is Erin Lee Seek. I live in Councilman Andy Nakan and Councilman Kevin Nakan's respective districts. I am calling tonight um, because this budget has given me a lot of concern, and trying to organize my thoughts around it has been a challenge. But uh, I'm calling mainly to support the efforts of Councilwomen Cook and Abear's ordinance to separate city tax dollars for parks and rec from the parish funded revenues. And I'm finding out that this has been pulled from the agenda later tonight. Um, and I would like to just share my support for it because I would like to see this expanded. I would like to see this adopted across all city tax dollars. And I would like to see it on this budget. The whole purpose of we as citizens voting to fix the charter was for this moment. The taxpayers want to have a clear voice in how our tax dollars are spent, and we want to see it on this budget. It is what we elected these councils and this administration to do. This budget is setting a precedent, so it is imperative that it be done correctly and that it be done completely. Waiting for another year could be detrimental. It sets a standard of continuing to pass the buck for later resolution which is something y'all are all grappling with now. Let's fix this now. And if that means taking more time to ensure all of this is done correctly, so be it. Press pause. Do not rush through a process that has so many huge consequences if it is not done properly. We have already seen how improper budgets in the past have lasting effects because you're dealing with them today. Don't add to that. And I think a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now could be avoided in the future with this move. We're seeing an outpour of community engagement on several issues, me included. I've never made a call to council before. I've never even emailed a council member before this budget. Um, but this is what should be happening, right? This is democracy at play. So listen to we the people. And what we want is a clear voice in our tax dollars. Because what we saw just a couple of weeks ago with an objection from the parish council against an, am an amendment proposed by Councilwoman Cook over funds for the Hyman Center is wrong. Councilman Carlton had no right to do this. The parish has no money that 
received into the Hyman Center. Yet Carlson felt entitled to have a say. And we saw this just a week or so after the parish council silenced the people. They were not allowed to speak at a discussion over parks and rec. This has been the top issue across the board on this budget, and they were silenced. This is wrong, and it should not happen. And it can be prevented from happening in the future if the city council would take further action to separate all city tax dollars. So I, I encourage you to do that. And I want to end on this note. Um, I've heard this term, a united front, used a lot by the administration and the parish council. And I think that's great. I, I think a united force and a united front is something we should all strive for. That's the best way we can move forward. It's how we work together. It's how we're efficient and how we, we get the things done. And I think the best way you can do that right now is by granting Lafayette City citizens the autonomy they asked for, a clear voice in their tax dollars because that is what they voted for. Honoring your constituents and supporting your fellow councilmen and ensuring that they abide by the voters' wishes is the best united front. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. How many we have left, V? Okay. The next speaker is Anna Claire Zarang. Ms. Zarang, you may begin speaking. Good evening. My name is Anna Claire Zarang, and I am a junior at St. Thomas More Catholic High School. I am calling on behalf of the Lafayette Parish 4-H program. A little bit about me is that I am a third generation 4-H'er. This will also be my seventh year in 4-H. I am currently the president-elect for the Lafayette Junior Leader Program. Vice Chair of the Louisiana State Food and Fitness Board, and I represent Louisiana 4-H as a whole as a national conference delegate. As you can tell, 4-H is a very special club to me. 4-H has provided me with so many life lessons and extraordinary opportunities. I sincerely want to thank you for supporting such an amazing club for not only me, but all 4-H members across the parish. 4-H is an exclusive club that welcomes everyone to learn and grow. From livestock and agriculture to sewing and STEM, there is certainly something for everyone. Your support helps build strong, young adults so that we can build a better future. In 4-H, our motto is to make the best better. And I truly believe that this program lives out that motto. 4-H has immensely helped me to grow my confidence, leadership, and team skills. I know for a fact that I've become a better leader, team member, speaker, student, daughter, sister, <clears throat> and friend, all because of 4-H. 4-H has helped me mold me into the person who I am today, and for that, I am forever grateful. Thank you so much for your time. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Final speaker. Next speaker is Anthony Luxack, 
You're the next speaker. You can begin speaking. Thank you very much. It's Luzak. Luzak. Hi, y'all. Yes, Luzak. <laughs> I would like to thank you, and I'd especially like to thank everybody that came before me today. I was really moved by the community coming forward yet again to speak about these issues. And so I am calling in for my first time ever uh, to talk on record. I live in Parish District 1. I'm calling in as a citizen in Parish District 1. I'm not in a city. And I'm really concerned about the process in which my parish council representatives are apparently allocating city council funds that are generated by city taxes and elected to be spent on services and resources within Lafayette city government. And somehow the parish council thinks that it's okay for them to veto or interfere with the city council's decisions for their funds. I, I feel like I really want to strongly urge the parish council that they have no business in interfering with the funding of the city government in the matters that are pertaining to services for the city. Also, I'm a certified pediatric nurse practitioner in primary care and a pediatric mental health specialist. I am obliged to speak on behalf of my patients and their families. I feel like this whole process that has been happening has resulted from a lack of conversation with stakeholders in the community. It comes from decision makers not understanding what it's like to live in different neighborhoods within the districts that you represent. And the presumption that people have the same transportation abilities and the same access based on a map by distance. The, the reality is that the children in my clinic, they cannot access a car to get anywhere. And this would have been very easily found out. We could have addressed many of these issues by just involving the community months ago in these decisions. I, in the future, I hope that you, as we move forward, please reach out and talk with the community, talk with the rec centers, talk with the people that use them, talk with the arts, talk with the education center. These things are what we're proud of in Lafayette. These things are necessary for the children. They're necessary for us to have a, a draw for other economic gains in the future because people want to raise families in places that have educational options and museums and the arts. And we need to have safe places for kids in the north side to go after school. We need to have all those things. And we need to have input from the community when you make decisions about the budget months ago. So I thank you very much for your time. I strongly, once again, would encourage you to leave the city council to, to the city's general fund and not interfere as parish council reps. And thank you all, all everyone that spoke before me. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Citizens who did not wish to speak, who emailed, called in, signed in uh, with reference to the following I items, recreation um, in support, 10 citizens signed in, the nature station in support, two citizens mm -hmm. signed in in support of funding, 
the Science Museum in support of funding 26 citizens, the Hyman Performing Arts in support 172 citizens, in opposition one, the LSU Ag Center in support nine citizens. That concludes the comments. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of those people that called in. Appreciate those that have uh, talked and called in. Uh, that's why we do what we do and we appreciate it very much. And uh, I'll get started here. Moving to resolution. This is a public hearing and speaker sheets are available for anyone wishing to address the council. The five minute rule is in effect. German, can you please read? Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, the announcements at the bottom. The budget wrap up is scheduled for Thursday, April 27th at 1 p.m. No vote on the budget will be taken today. Okay. August, I'm sorry, August 27th. Budget wrap up is scheduled for Thursday, August 27th, 1 p.m. Budget final adoption is scheduled for Thursday, September 10th at 530. All right. Thank you. Resolution. This is a public hearing and speaker sheets are available for anyone wishing to address the council. Five minute rule does apply. Please read, German. Joint resolution 21, 2020. A joint resolution of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council amending resolution JR3, 2020, which establishes the rules and order of business for the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council. Okay, I need a motion and a second from the Parish Council. Motion by Councilman Gilbo, second by Councilman Tabor. Okay, I need a motion and a second from the City Council. Motion by Mr. Andy Nakin. Second by Ms. Cook. Okay. Any council discussion? Okay. Ms. Williams, do you want to just kind of I'm sure with all the conversation and the comments, they weren't probably reading this thing and saying, well, what kind of rules and what regulations or what, what's being on? Mr. Escott, can you chime in just to kind of give the public a brief explanation of what the resolution's asking for or, or what it's saying? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Essentially, the, the amendment relates to uh, public comment for items not on the agenda, which is sometimes referred to as open mic night. Uh, the rules as amended would result in the uh, open mic night or those comment periods for the parish council being on the first Tuesday of the month meeting and the city council would have its open mic night or open public comment on the third Tuesday which would be the second meeting of the month uh, and those um, there would be no uh, open mic night for the joint meetings. Um, that way the public can address either council on any issue that it has, whether it's individual to that council or a joint issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Escott, appreciate it. All right, um, any public comment? No, sir. Okay, please call the vote for each council. Parish District 1? Yes. Parish District 2? Yes. Parish District 3? Yes. Parish District 4? Yes. City District 1? Yes. City District 2? Yes. City District 3? Yes. City District 4? Yes. City District 5? Yes. Motion to adopt by the Parish Council is approved. Motion to adopt by the City Council is approved. Okay, moving right along. Let's go to ordinances for final adoption. This is a public hearing. The speaker sheets are available for anyone wishing to address this council. There is a five minute rule that is in effect. Jeremy, please read. Joint Ordinance 74 2020, a joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council, authorizing the Lafayette Mayor President to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with the University of Louisiana at Lafayette regarding study of flooding and channel capacity within Lafayette Parish. Okay, I need a motion and a second from the Parish Council. Motion by Councilman Carlson, second by Councilman Gilbo. Okay, I need a motion and a second from the city council. Motion by Mr. Glenn Lazar, second by Mr. Andy Naki. Okay, any council discussions in regards to this? Seeing none, Ms. Williams, any public comments? No, no, sir. Call the vote. Parish District 2? Yes. Parish District 3? Yes. Parish District 4? Yes. Parish District 1? Yes. City District 2? Yes. City District 3? Yes. City District 4? City District 5? Yes. City District 1? 
Motion to adopt by the Parish Council is approved. Motion to adopt by the City Council is approved. Okay, now we move to introductory ordinances. I'll need a motion in a second to intro glo uh, in global items seven through 11 from the Parish Council. Motion by Councilman Tabor, second by Councilman Gilbo. Okay, I need a motion and a second to introduce in global item seven through 11 from the City Council. Motion by Ms. Liz A. Bear. Second by Mr. Andy Nakin. Okay, Jeremy, please read the following uh, ordinances. Joint Ordinance 76, 2020. A joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council amending the fiscal year 1920 operating budget of the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government to adjust amounts for administrative and general costs to actual. Joint Ordinance 77, 2020. A joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council amending the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government Code of Ordinances, Chapter 6, Alcoholic Beverages, specifically Article 1 in general, particularly to add Section 6-14.1. Joint Ordinance 78, 2020. A joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council amending the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government Code of Ordinances, Chapter 62, Offenses and Miscellaneous Provision, specifically Article 1, Crime and Offenses in City of Lafayette, particularly to add Section 62-89.1, Downtown Curfew Hours for Minors. Joint Ordinance 79-2020, a joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council amending the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government Code of Ordinances, Chapter 78, Streets, Sidewalks, and Other Public Places, specifically Article 1 in general, particularly to add Section 78-4, Congestion of Sidewalks and Areas Adjacent to Public Roads. Joint Ordinance 80-2020, a joint ordinance of the Lafayette City Council and the Lafayette Parish Council declaring the stormwater management project a public necessity and authorizing the acquisition of the necessary rights of way, immovable property, and other property rights requisite to the construction of said project either on an amicable basis or through the use of the expropriation process if necessary. Any comments from the public? Yes, sir. We do have comments from the public. We have five speakers signed in under item number 10, which is in reference to congestion of sidewalk and a changing, amending a code of ordinance with reference to, to same. We did have citizens who did not wish to speak who signed in, called in, or emailed 46 in opposition to the ordinance. And the five speakers, we will start with Jared Eubanks, followed by Jackie Lau.
this thing is to begin with. It's illegal to be within 36 inches of the road or in a median that's only 36 inches wide. A median, by definition, is between two roads. It would have to be at least 72. It'd still be illegal, so I guess at least 72 plus however big you are to be in the median. This whole thing is a joke. I'm sure you guys are going to introduce it. It is an introductory, um, and just honestly to save time at this point, introducing these at large. But the conversation needs to be had that this is incredulous. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Is Jackie Lau still here? Okay. The next speaker is a call in. Hey, V. Someone that let us know that the audio is not working on AOC on, on TV. mic wise, I just have the two podium mics on, and that's it. Next speaker is Lee Rochelle. You may begin speaking. Hello, my name is Lee Rochelle. I'm the executive director of ARCH, the Acadiana Regional Coalition on Homelessness and Housing. I'm also a resident of Lafayette City and Parish Districts Number 2. I was very concerned about this ordinance, which would make it a misdemeanor for people to sit or stand for any period of time on certain public spaces. I can't imagine that this law is actually constitutional, but I will leave that particular question to the lawyers. I will just say that more and more court courts are ruling against this type of law, so I would urge us to be careful in that regard. But I would like to focus tonight on something that I've mentioned a few times before. We are facing a historic crisis of housing insecurity and homelessness in Lafayette. The reduction of federal unemployment benefits along with the lifting of the federal eviction moratorium means that many of Lafayette citizens will lose their housing in the next several months. And there is no shelter. There's no safety net. There's no programs that can provide crisis housing for our neighbors in need. And this is not just impacting low-income renters. In Lafayette, 11% of those with mortgages were more than 90 days past due as of June 2020. Foreclosures will also add to the homelessness crisis shortly. The number of people experiencing homelessness in Acadiana has approximately doubled in less than five months. There were 420 people known to be homeless in January 2020. During the month of July 2020, 838 people experienced homelessness. That's a record number for Acadiana. As of right now, there are 308 households, which amounts to 453 people, including 107 children, that are sheltered within the ARCH COVID-19 Emergency Hotel Shelter Program in Lafayette. Those households have no other housing to go to at this time, and without the assistance of that program, they would be unsheltered and living outside on the street. Due to the uncertain nature of the FEMA funding, ARCH has had to stop placing new households into the hotel about two weeks ago. Once the FEMA funding for those hotel rooms ends, those families will leave the hotels and face unsheltered homelessness. Over the past several months, ARCH has worked tirelessly to ensure that the people of Lafayette, the surrounding parishes, have access to emergency non-congregate shelter during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I believe these efforts have saved lives. The hotel program has prevented homeless individuals from congregating in traditional shelters or in our downtown parks. It's prevented the spread of COVID-19 amongst the vulnerable population. It's also prevented those experiencing homelessness from spreading a virus to the rest of the population. To date, there have only been two known cases of COVID-19 within the homeless population of Lafayette. I'm afraid, however, that for all the good that those programs have done, it's also hidden the problem from those who need to see and address it. The homeless population of Lafayette has ballooned overnight, more than doubling our pre-COVID levels. It's been hidden in hotel rooms and not visible on the streets of Lafayette. But now, as the FEMA funding is drying up and because other resources have been diverted away from housing, homelessness is becoming more visible in our town, and this is just the beginning. And at just the beginning of this homelessness crisis, we found our 
we find our shelter system already way past overwhelmed. There are not nearly enough resources to assist our neighbors who are facing crisis where they've literally lost their home. And I beg you not to add to the crisis, making it illegal for humans to just sit or stand outside. This is a classic example of criminalizing homelessness. Without adequate shelter available, we have to ask ourselves, where do we want for people to go when they have no home? People have physical bodies, and those bodies have to go somewhere. Where would we have them go? Asking people to keep moving along is simply unacceptably cruel and never solves the problem. Further, when you factor in cost for police time, booking, court time, et cetera, this turns into a pretty expensive process with no tangible benefit for our community. But mostly, I think we need to be talking about holistic solutions. We can't solve problems by creating ordinances to cater to special interest groups. We have to have open conversations, look at national best practices, bring all the stakeholders to the table, and find solutions. We need to be looking for ways to assist the citizens in our community who are hurting. We also need to protect businesses, and we can do both. Let's work together on those ordinances and find true solutions. Please vote down this ordinance and reach out to me at any time to discuss possible solutions that will help us move out of this housing crisis in a way that can benefit everyone. Thank you for listening. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Two more speakers. Next speaker, William Teeley. Mr. Teeley, you may begin speaking. Hello, my name is Will Teeley. I live in City District 2 and Parish District 5. Councilman Andy Nakan and A.B. Rubin represent me. So thank you to them and thank you to everyone on both councils. I have major concerns about this ordinance. If I'm understanding this correctly, if passed, no citizen in the city or parish of Lafayette would be allowed to sit or stand for even one second if they are three feet of a roadway, if they're on an unpaved median, or if they're on a median that's within three feet of a roadway. I do see that there is one exception in the ordinance that if you're at a bus stop. But based on how this is written, it would be illegal for you to walk to the bus stop. The walk from your home to the bus stop would be breaking the law. But once you hit the bus stop, assuming you weren't stopped by the police and ticketed, you're now safe. This is terrible. Who thought of this? Why does the administration keep thinking of ways to attack the poorest and most vulnerable people in our city and parish? One justification I can try to think of is that maybe there's a safety issue and pedestrians are getting hit by cars. But the way you address that concern is by making our city more walkable and install more bike lanes and sidewalks, not by criminally punishing pedestrians. Another justification I can try to think of is that you're trying to criminalize being homeless because we all know we have a homeless crisis coming up. And in which case, that's another horrible justification. Again, why are you, instead of addressing the root of the problem, why are you criminalizing people who are simply trying to survive? I'm worried this ordinance will empower our law enforcement to harass pedestrians who are simply walking around, but since they are now technically violating the law, despite the fact they're not hurting anybody, they can be stopped, questioned, and harassed. I'm worried about our downtown events, like Festival International, Downtown Alive, Art Walk, other festivals, like the Po'boy Festival, or the Boudin Cook-Off. Lots of people walk around these events, and they spend lots of money at these events, supporting our local economy. I don't understand why you would try to criminalize pedestrians. What about local youth groups or church groups who are raising money for their organization? What about people who are waving political signs during elections, like I did for Fix the Charter? What about people just jogging down the road for their health, especially the people who are about to lose their rec centers? Are all these people criminals now? Like, I don't even vote to introduce this. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you.
Final speaker. Next speaker is Kim Boudreau. You may begin speaking. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kim Boudreau, and I'm the CEO of Catholic Charities of Acadiana. I've also been a downtown resident for the last 15 years. I want to start off by thanking the council for approving the PDBG rent and utility assistance that has been um, allocated to Catholic Charities. Those funds are currently um, being used uh, to help our citizens in helping to uh, bridge that gap for them uh, as they struggle during this crisis to pay their rent and utilities. Um, we're receiving um, a high call volume at this time, and those funds are currently in use. And so I just wanted to express my gratitude uh, for, those, um, for the allocation of those funds to rent and utility assistance. Uh, I, I think that Lee carried um, a great message, and I wanted to uh, reiterate everything that she shared um, in her uh, five minutes before. Um, our people that are experiencing a housing crisis have nowhere else to go right now. Um, our congregate shelters are not able to safely operate at this time, and we're not able to reopen those shelters until we're able to modify our buildings. I don't have a timeline on when we'll be able to uh, begin our construction, much less complete it, um, but I don't expect that it would be before the end of this year. In addition to our shelters not operating, uh, which traditionally held over 100 people um, every night, Salvation Army has also permanently closed their shelter, um, and there are no, are no other options. The hotel program is no longer accepting new people in and the clock is starting to tick on how long they have until the people that are in that program have until they need to move out. There's literally no place for people to go when they're facing a housing crisis and they're sleeping on the streets. We're having phone calls after phone calls with people that have lost their housing on a daily basis, and we're having to help them understand how to keep themselves safe and sometimes their children safe while sleeping on the streets of Lafayette. This is a devastating situation. Um, in the last few years, as many of you know, we have made the decision as an organization to not turn anyone away when they come to us seeking shelter at night. For the last three and a half, four years, we've literally accepted anyone every night that has come to us for shelter, and we're not able to do that anymore. People who experience homelessness are often faced with multitude of health issues and they're more likely to experience complications and death from COVID. They're more likely to require hospitalization, and they're also likely to contribute to community spread because of their inability to protect themselves. Also, not to mention, it's really hot right now, and this is the time of year that we would normally open up all of our buildings to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to go inside and get out of the heat because this is the time of year that we would normally be calling 911 for heat stroke. Um, it was a, not uncommon for us to make um, five to ten phone calls a day to 911 for people experiencing heat stroke um, that were um, outside and dehydrated. Also, food access has been a challenge. Um, we're not able to serve congregate um, meal programs like we have traditionally in the past at St. Joseph's Diner. So, um, trying to identify where everybody is um, has been a challenge. Um, without our feeding programs, people that are food insecure and unsheltered have three choices. They can beg customers and employees in front of restaurants, they can panhandle, or they can steal. Those are their three options. As a community, we have to figure out what we're going to do about that. I think that my request to you is to invest in actual solutions um, earlier, a few months ago, we redirected HUD housing to businesses. Um, reports are coming out that those are slow to be spent on the businesses, and if it's possible to reconsider, as we originally discussed that night, that those funds were voted on, um, if some of those funds could be redirected back to housing, that would be fantastic. That would help us to be able to say yes to more people when they come to us in crisis. Um, and I, 
I would hope that all of us have a desire to, to address this issue and to figure out how to, how to work towards solutions and not just band-aids. And so I'm happy to work with uh, the councils and work with our community on identifying solutions. Um, this is going to be an unprecedented time for our community, and I think we all need to come together uh, for those that are suffering in our community, that are from our community. Um, I don't want there to be this idea that if we make it uncomfortable for them that they'll move on to another community. These are our citizens. Um, these are our people, and we need to respond to them in their crisis. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I have a question for legal and for mayor, president. Who came up with this ordinance? What was it about? What issues brought this? And what is the intent of this, uh, this ordinance? Thank Obviously, it's got a lot of people concerned, a lot of people calling in. Yeah, sure. And I'll let legal upon on the, the constitutionality of this ordinance. I know that there was a lot of calls and talks about homelessness, but this ordinance has nothing to do with that. So it's mainly about uh, congestion and safety. So I would like legal to opine in regards to the constitutionality. I think there's a Tenth Circuit case or whatnot. Right. Okay. Yeah, if somebody can come up front or if it's Greg or, or if, okay. And while he's uh, walking up, I would like to add, I didn't want to interrupt Ms. Boudreaux, but uh, work with a few council members in regards to addressing the homeless pro uh, pro issue, um, utilities, rental assistance, and work working with Director Conway, I believe we've identified another 100,000 that we could potentially rededicate and also, or excuse me, 300,000 that uh, we can rededicate and potentially revisit the micro grants to pull another 100,000 um, out of that. So that would be 400,000 that could help uh, either Catholic Charities or Arch address this very uh, growing concern as uh, their funding is getting cut from the state as well. So, but I think legal's ready and it's all yours. So sure. this ordinance is based on an ordinance that's been held constitutional out of the 10th Circuit to deal with the congregating of people right up against the street. Most sidewalks are more than three feet wide. I think by uh, safety regulations, most of them are four, five, six feet wide at the minimum. There's over 2,200 acres unaffected by this ordinance. So it's basically to keep people from sitting or standing within the 36 inches of the roadway. And like I say, Based on our research, it's the only one that's held up as constitutional, trying to address issues we have. It does not affect the homeless. It does not affect the callers are saying joggers or walkers. It does not affect that. Or people walking on the sidewalk to catch the bus or? Well, they'd have to sit or stand or congregate for an extended period of time. Do we know what that time is? Um, the ordinance refers to I'm just saying because some people, the right. bus might be running late and somebody well, the, might call and complain that, oh, there's 10 kids sitting right here. Well, the bus the... stops are exempted, specifically okay. set forth and exempted, uh, whether they be a city bus stop, a school bus stop. Those are all exempted. Yeah. And there's no there's no sidewalks and, in the parish, just to let everyone know. Right, I mean, we're working on that. Okay. Also, uh, So there's not going to be no parish <laughs> issue here. Right, well, right guys? It, all right. Unpaved, <laughs> unpaved sidewalks. But, but also, Mr. Right. Chair, just to add, that those bus stops are also identified by the school board and obviously the city as well. So the fear that they're calling in about joggers, walkers, uh, all of those things that were mentioned, you feel that that doesn't really affect that or that's that not that's legitimate. not what the, the intent of this ordinance is not at all okay. and it specifically says sit or stand okay so. and is that something that you guys in legal found or y'all had issues or people were calling making complaints and needed to see about this because it's the first i ever heard of we've had a lot of issues call, they call and shake me down when i'm in public but no absolutely okay just drive around town you can see it no problem i uh, mean go ahead i'm sorry uh just drive around town as the mayor president said you know it's a safety issue the light turns green traffic moves on there's one car stopped while the person in the car is looking for their change the person coming from behind sees a green light they may not realize that that car is sitting dead stop so we need to get the pedestrians away from it's causing traffic it's causing a safety issue okay councilwoman miss cook Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, that was going to be my question. What what issues 
are we seeing? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, maybe I don't drive around enough. I, I'm not noticing what the issues are. So you're saying there's, there's a lot of people that are just hanging out on the sidewalks and holding signs uh, for stores closing okay, okay. and um, panhandling and right. begging. I don't know. I don't know what else you call it. You know, they'll park their car and then go panhandle. And how um, how are we going to enforce this? I'm just I'm just curious. I mean, They'll do be someone a misdemeanor summons? But I mean, somebody will. I mean, the police are. You know, somebody will have to call it in, or I mean, or I guess the police observe it. See the it. police are on patrol and observe it. Okay. Okay, that's that's just just curious. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Abia. Well, I actually had a, a situation on the way here to the council office. I actually was stopped at Johnson and Ambassador. So there's a lot of talk about downtown, uh, but even south side of town, Johnson and Ambassador, there was a gentleman side of the road begging for money, weaving in and out. He was in front of my car, stopped in front of my vehicle. Light was green. I'm not, as a female, going to honk at a, a person stumbling around in front of my car. I don't know what's going to happen. I've seen too many videos on Facebook, but... So for me, it happened on the way here, which was pretty timely. So there, there is an issue. We know, as Ken Boudreau with Catholic Charities mentioned, we're seeing it is becoming, homelessness is becoming an issue, whether by, we obviously know there's a choice, right? We know we're in a pandemic. People are losing their jobs. They're getting kicked out of their homes. They're having trouble paying their rent. And it, we, whether we're just seeing it downtown or we're seeing it all the way in my district on the south side, we need to address it before we become a big city where we have 10 cities and things like that. Could this be massaged? Absolutely. Can we part, I would, like I told uh, the mayor and uh, our attorney is, I want us to partner and rather than just putting this ordinance in place is partnering with people to back it with dollars. And the mayor just said that he has $400,000, which was more than the 100,000 you told me earlier. So loving that we're finding that because we have to put our money where our mouth is and we can't just bust people downtown or bust them to jail and just hope for the best is we've got to work and take care of them. Because look, the stats have said eight out of 10 people who are on the side of the road are panhandlers who don't need help. But I can tell you, as I was sitting at that light today, four people in front of me gave money to that guy. Whether he needed it or not is not my place to judge those people. But I'd rather see my money and my dollars go to, whether it's Catholic Charities or Smile or HUT or any of these organizations who are proven to do the right things and give the money to the people who need it in our community. And I think that's what we all want, right? So I'm making a pledge to work with the mayor, work with Catholic Charities, and I'm saying Catholic Charities, but I know there's a million other organizations out there, local organizations where the money stays here and goes to a reputable group that can get to the people who need it. So that's what I encourage all my fellow council members to work with me on this. I know we can be united in this and help before our city becomes a major homeless issue. We have an issue now, but we need to stop before it gets worse. So I thank you, Mayor, thank you. for finding $400,000. I'm sure we can find even more money where that came from, right? So there's, there's HUD there. money, there's CARES Act What's money. For? So I look forward to working with you guys yeah, on I wish. that. And um, that's all I have. So thank you very much. Okay. And thank thank you, you, Councilwoman. Also, just big credit to our Director of Community Development. So uh, I was I was in agreement with 100,000 when I talked to him. He said, well, actually, we just found out there's another 300 that wasn't used that we can come back to the council to rededicate if that's the purpose of the council, if you want to uh, appropriate it to homelessness or utility assistance, rental assistance, real, real, rental assistance, all worthy causes. Um, but so that's where the extra three came. So it's, it's actually Hollis, give him all the credit. Thank wherever you. he is, I think he was out there. Thank you for that and thank you Hollis. I, I saw you back there somewhere, but I wanna maybe be more specific with my words. It's not just homelessness, right. but rental, thank you for that. Rental and utility assistance is what I'm hoping for. So I wanna keep people in their homes and pe get people into homes. That's what I wanted to clarify. So thank you for that. Okay. Councilman Lewis, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting a little confused right here now. Are we talking about homeless people or panhandlings or a certain group of people? I'm trying to figure out who are and who are we targeting, what are we talking about? I, I do not believe that this will affect homeless people as, in my experience, observing them, no, no other experience, they don't sleep 
up against the road. They sleep away from the road. And they're, like I say, there's over 2,200 acres. Most right-of-ways are wide, um, so they're not right up against the road. So I don't think this is targeting homeless people at all. So, so who are we targeting? Panhandlers? Panhandlers. So is that people why? in traffic okay. har harassing well, the... Well, why can't, we, why can't we identify that? Why can't we identify that? Is that too general? Unfortunately, the United States Supreme Court has said panhandling is okay. So if you say panhandlers, it will be declared unconstitutional. This has been found yeah. constitutional. Well, well Ms. Abair just said that she was on Johnson Street and she didn't feel safe because it was panhandling. And someone gave X amount of dollars before. So, I mean, what are we talking about? If, if it's constitutional saying that it's okay to panhandle, I mean, what are we, but they can't are we do it in traffic. They can't get and obstruct the roadway. They can't. They they can't be. Uh, they're affecting the safety of other individuals driving down that roadway, and that's why this has been held constitutional. And there's other space in Lafayette City and Lafayette Parish far enough away from the roadway where they can safely congregate and do what they want to do. And we know they're not, you know, we all know that, you know, panhandlers just come to your car at a signal light, stop sign, whatever, they just come up. So I, I, I understand what you guys are getting at, but if we're going to target a certain group of people, let's spell it out. Let's see who we are targeting, not just making a general statement that no matter who's doing what and, and that, we need to, you know, pretty much identify who we, if it's not homeless, let's get homeless out of there. That's my, that's just my comment. I understand. Yes. Okay. Councilman Lazard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. My original intentions was to move to defer this item. Uh, so that uh, I could get some more information. But I decided to go ahead and let it proceed through introduction so that we could start the conversation. Um, it is time we have that conversation. I'm not at all comfortable, and I want to make this perfectly clear up front, I'm not at all comfortable with this ordinance the way it's written. Um, I think it's a false assumption to assume that homeless people don't panhandle or that <laughs> no panhandlers, as we call them, are homeless. I think that's two false assumptions. Um, we know that for the most part, and I'm not saying that's the intent of the ordinance, but it's going to have a disproportionate impact on a certain class of people. Just the reality of it. Uh, Liz, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to where you get your information from that eight out of 10 people don't need help. That, that, that really kind of boggles my mind. I'm not saying it's incorrect, I'm just saying that it's something that just boggles my mind. Uh, so I'm not sure what the source of your information is. Um, we certainly need to have the conversation. Uh, it, it's just kind of ironic that, <laughs> that a couple of months ago, we were talking about this grant and I made a request that I think 20, 25% of it go to addressing this particular issue. We did find some money to begin the process, and I certainly want to compliment the mayor and Hollis in their efforts in doing so. But it's kind of ironic that we decided to give this entire grant to businesses with the knowledge that at the time homelessness was on the rise 
and that it was going to increase. And we've seen that. So now, <laughs> so now we have businesses complaining <laughs> about homelessness. <laughs> Just kind of a paradox there. Uh, we certainly need to have the conversation. And if this is going to be the start of the conversation, then that's a good thing. But we need to find a comprehensive solution. As somebody said, bringing all the parties to the table. Um, I just have some serious doubts about the, what the real intent of this ordinance is. And hopefully I can get some clarification within the next two weeks. So I just want to mention that I allowed it to proceed and didn't pull it so that we could start the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Councilman Andy not can you have the floor, sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it appears to me that this introductory ordinance is more about public safety than anything. It's not targeting any person. It's just trying to make sure that the people driving automobiles, trucks, whatever, on the roadways don't have to worry about encounter, encountering a pedestrian just standing there on the side of the road, possibly interfering with the flow of traffic. They're not going to be targeting somebody out there that needs help, that's carrying his luggage with him, trying to find a place to get to. I don't think that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be going after the guy standing with the sign, need help. And he's on every corner, waving down people, walking into the street, creating safety issues for people. Um, Interim Chief Morgan, would you mind stepping up to one of the mics? I just, out of curiosity, I'm sure you have encountered these situations before in, in dealing with people such as this and had to interact with them. And in your experience, again, not trying to point fingers, but how many of these people do you think actually are from Lafayette? that are sitting there doing this? Uh, if I can preempt that, 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 uh, an answer to that question, we're not talking sure. about eliminating any of those processes where no. they have the right to do this. Correct. Just a specific area where they're not in traffic or in the medians. Exactly. Uh, where we don't allow pedestrians to normally be. It's just not an uh, area that is designed for that. Uh, but a majority of our people are Drifters, they come through town, they may be traveling somewhere, it may be a lifestyle, being a nomad is not necessarily uh, an unusual Prime. lifestyle no. these days. Right. Uh, we do see people who drive up to the place, they'll get out of their car, they'll go there. Now we don't know, necessarily know their circumstances, they may be using some of that money for hotels and stuff, right. uh, but it's not the traditional uh, aspect of what you would think homeless people are always going out there to panhandle. We don't know what their intent may be. We don't know their background. Sometimes we have people who come in and out of town uh, that don't have the most admirable backgrounds. Uh, and again, it's not to keep them from doing any of these things. We just don't want them so close to traffic where it imposes or poses on the driver. Right now, you can get up against the edge of the road, and basically stand there, and then it becomes the motorist who may or may not see them's uh, obligation to try to avoid a pedestrian that probably shouldn't be in that area. Yeah, and that creates a safety issue for both. I mean, the motorist would be involved in an incident where he could be found liable for hitting a pedestrian, you know, so there's a lot of issues there. Uh, I mean, guesstimating 60%, 65 75% are not from here, you would say? That, that would truly be hard to say exactly. Yeah. Uh, the majority of people, like right now, we're not seeing the same people. We, we see different people all day long at, right. at different intersections yeah. that may be uh, stopping through, and again, they may be passing through. But some of these people don't have identification. There's no way for us to identify them. Um, and this can be very thing. lucrative for these people, too, at times, can it not? I, I could tell you in my day of, of patrolling the streets, and this is just from my experience, we've pulled wads of money out of people's pockets and, and drugs out of the other one. Now, I'm not trying to say that that is all circumstances, because I have seen people down on right. their luck in the same uh, circumstance. But uh, I would say it could be lucrative. Very lucrative. Uh, Interim Chief Morgan, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Okay. I don't see any other thing. Let me ask you this from a parish standpoint. This applies to us? Yes. Okay. Wherever there are sidewalks, right? Sidewalks are meet unpaved medians. They, you know, they can't be in the 
Unpaid right. meeting. Well, I know we have some unincorporated sure. area pockets in the city of Lafayette, so I mean, I, I totally get it. I just wanted to yeah. verify and, and just, you know, for the record, know exactly what's what. But in the unincorporated area over there where I live, Lafayette PD is not going to be coming. <laughs> so is this ordinance going to be backed up by the sheriff? Your mic is hot, sir. I can't answer for the sheriff, but it would be a procedural vehicle that he would he could use if he chose to. But I did, okay. do need to correct you, though, Mr. Chair, with all due respect. It's not a us and you. It's and them. It's not a you and me. Every square inch of the city of Lafayette is in the parish of Lafayette. And there are, are, there are people that put all five of you in office, and I'll count Councilman Rubin, who's not here, but here with us in spirit. <laughs> many voters, many constituents in the city limits of Lafayette are also your constituents. So we can't have this. So you have plenty of sidewalks in your district. Yeah. I have sidewalks. Yep. We got them. You have sidewalks? In the you want to compare? We, we have them. Oh, see, there you go. You've been working hard. We have them. <laughs> I guess... Uh, I guess the, the parish council has just been a punching bag for other reasons and hearing right. conversations about we're stopping the city from doing so. I just want to be clear. If y'all well, want to defer this so y'all want to direct it and build it to what y'all want, mm -hmm. please do because these guys and I ain't going to get blamed for no more stuff. <laughs> just saying. We're going to work together. We're going to work together. But we, we do got sidewalks and we're going to introduce it and we can have this discussion more discussion about it and if it needs to be changed or it needs to be amended whatever whatever we got to do to figure it out to make it all happen i'm here to play i'm here to work so let's get it done thank you thank done. you all right not seeing any other council discussion done with public comment please call the vote to introduce in global joint ordinances items 7 through 11. Bill. parish district 3 yes parish district 4 Yes. Parish District 1? Yes. Parish District 2? Yes. City District 2? Yes. City District 3? Yes. City District 4? Yes. City District 5? Yes. City District 1? Yes. Motion to introduce in Globo by the Parish Council is approved. Motion to introduce in Globo by the City Council is approved. I'll turn to City Council meeting. I didn't have the mic on.